Welcome, hello, quantum information science lovers. I'd like to welcome you all to the Air Force's virtual quantum collider event. There are over 1,200 of you that have registered for today's event, and I trust you're ready to hear from some of the foremost experts in quantum technologies. My name is Mark Romano from NYSEC, and I'll be your master of ceremonies for today's event. For all of you listening today, we welcome you to please join the conversation on social media by using the hashtag 2020 Quantum Collider. Lastly, I can say on behalf of the organizers and presenters of this event, we are absolutely thrilled to have you as part of the virtual Quantum Collider to witness this exciting lineup of speakers. You'll hear from me from time to time throughout the event, but this day is for you. Folks that are passionate about cur the current state of quantum information science and what the future holds for this emerging technology. At this point, I'd like to welcome Dr. Roper to introduce our next guest. First of all, uh, it's, it's a real honor and a privilege to be a part of this, uh, this amazing kickoff. And I'm excited uh, to just be able to join you remotely. Um, you know, I guess in true quantum fashion, I'm trying to be two places at one time working with you and then here in the Pentagon. It's wonderful uh, to have members of Congress um, that are so interested in uh, technical fields, things that are probably a further step away from the types of activities and subjects that they use in their in their day to day lives or the platforms that they run on as members of Congress. And quantum technology is probably not something that's going to pop up in a town hall meeting. But the fact that we have members that that care so much about technical fields that the U.S. needs to dominate and be in the forefront on, especially those that could have extreme import to our military is a breath of fresh air. We need more members of Congress to really dig into these technical challenges. And uh, for those that happen to have uh, great uh, facilities like AFRL and other Air Force installations in their backyards, we're very thankful that we get to be the doorstep that introduces uh, these technical fields uh, so that they become important, not just for us, but for the nation writ large. I'm very thankful that we're able to, to have the Congressman join us this morning. Uh, so thankful that the IT situation finally came together so that we can do this remotely with safe social distancing uh, mechanisms in place. And without any further ado or interest from me, Congressman, over to you and welcome this morning. Thanks, Dr. Roper. Good to be with you. Good to be with everyone on the call this morning. Hope everyone is uh, staying safe and uh, everyone's healthy. Uh, thank you for allowing me to participate in this event. It's a, an incredible opportunity to be able to have these important discussions today with some of the brightest minds in quantum science. As a member of the House Armed Services Committee, I'm committed to ensuring we continue to invest in quantum information science, which is of critical importance for the future national security and economic competitiveness for the United States. I am so proud of the advances we have made over the past few years uh, with the standing up of the Open Innovation Campus in Rome, and the Quantum Information Science Innovation Center in August 2020, uh, 2020 uh, coming up in August 2020 here in Rome, New York. Events such as this uh, allow us to bring together the small business community, uh, industry, academia, and our Department of Defense labs, which allows for faster and more efficient development of quantum technology. This type of collaboration will enable the United States to retain an advantage over foreign competitors. I am particularly concerned about the United States keeping pace with China in terms of our investments and adva advancements in information technologies, specifically quantum information sciences. China understands the strategic importance of uh, quantum technology to both its economy and its military. This is a race we cannot afford to lose as a country, and I'm confident we will outpace them because of the people in this room and on this call and the strong collaboration between our DOD research institutions, small businesses, industry, and academia. Uh, in closing, I'd like to briefly update you all on the work I'm doing on the Armed Services Committee to move the ball forward in this critical area. I'm going to be pushing for significant funding increases for Rome Labs account, which would fund three major cutting edge projects. Number one, uh, the DOD federal trusted UAS traffic management and counter UAS testbed. 
This will focus on the development of a DOD federal UAS traffic management system and tools to enable federal agencies, including DOD, DHS, DOJ, DOI, and FAA slash TSA to operate UAS in the national airspace, whether training or supporting tasks such as security operation. For example, protection of military assets, airports, the National Mall, seamlessly in controlled and uncontrolled airspace. Second, the quantum network test bed. Funding would begin the initial design and construction for a first of its kind, large wide area quantum wide area network to be located across the state of New York with the prospects of ultimately connecting AFRL Rome and include participants from across the SUNY, the SUNY system, uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory, SUNY Albany. The project will be led by AFRL in Rome and include participants from across the SUNY system, BNL, and other leading US universities. The long distance distributed network will provide the backbone for many new revolutionary quantum technologies, including data protection and long distance large capacity quantum communication and networking. And finally, third, the Quantum Innovation Center Info Processor Collider. Funding the Quantum Information Science Innovation Center Info Processor Collider effort will foster and grow the local quantum ecosystem, bringing together government, industry, and academic partners, as well as other non-traditional partners, including those from foreign countries who cannot normally work within the confines of Rome Lab. This funding will be used to continue to develop the Information Directorate and QIS Innovation, Innovation Center as national leaders in quantum information science. I want to use my, my seat and my role on the House Armed Services Committee to help uh, benefit our district, our state, and our country, and installations and organizations that are on this call to ensure the U.S., Central New York, and our nation continue to lead in quantum science. Thank you all for being on the call again this morning. Sorry for the technical difficulties and uh, my door is always open. Look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Congressman, thank you so much for the opening remarks. We really do need more members of Congress to take the strategic view and a long-term competition with China. We can't get bogged down in near-term issues because it feels like these that could end up making the next generation uh, industrial base where we've got to ensure that we win and maintain innovation as our leading edge. So I applaud you for thinking ahead, for making sure that all quantum roads lead to Rome, and I really applaud all the work that Rome Lab is doing in your district. So um, on behalf of the Air Force and Space Force, Anthony, thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope that if you get a few minutes in your, in your busy day, uh, maybe today or this afternoon, that you might join back in, because uh, I'm sure we'll all learn a lot from hearing uh, what's just not art of the possible in the future, but what's what's art of the possible on our watch. So thank you for your leadership on this issue, sir. Thank you, Dr. Roper. Good to be with you, and uh, thanks everyone on the call. Look forward to working with you guys much more uh, down the road here. Thank you. We have a few more introductions to make, Dr. Roper, and then we're going to come back to you for your keynote that we're all waiting for. It is my next pleasure of the day to introduce Stephen Johns of the Air Force Research Laboratory. Steve is the branch chief of the AFRL Quantum Information Sciences branch, located here in Rome, New York, uh, and one of the main architects of today's program. Steve, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce and kick off the first U.S. Air Force Virtual Quantum Collider event. Over 1,200 people have registered for today's event, a number that far exceeds any of our expectations. Back in November of 2019, on a visit to Air Force Research Laboratory in Rome, New York, Dr. Roper challenged Colonel Lawrence to develop an, an event to advance quantum technology. So here we are today with this groundbreaking program. This STTR program was designed to advance quantum technologies in the areas of quantum timing, quantum sensing, quantum processing and computing, and quantum tech communications and networking. We also have an outstanding, outstanding lineup of speakers that will excite and be entertaining. Before we move on to today's event, I would like to give thanks to many people who have worked very hard to make this event a reality. The Air Force cannot say thank you enough to Dr. Roper, 
We could not have accomplished this program without your guidance and full support. Your efforts will change the quantum community forever and speed up the delivery of quantum technology needed for future warfighter needs. Also, thank you, Mr. Shahidi. The leadership you have displayed in the support of your Cyber Sitter Office has made a significant impact on this event and the future of all Air Force quantum programs. Next, I'd like to thank my immediate team of Ms. Denise Lee and Ms. Laura Longo. Both of you have worked long hours over the past several months to bring this event to fruition. You have done an incredible job and I cannot thank you enough for your hard work and dedication. Next, thank you to the behind the scenes teams, including the technical, contracting, financial, communications, and many, many other individuals. Over 45 personnel from across Air Force Research Laboratory, the Air Force Small Business Office, and AFWORKS have provided critical support for this event. This is a job well done. Finally, thank you to NYSTEC and the National Security Innovation Network for your superior guidance and support in the planning and execution of this event. Now I'd like to turn this over and introduce Ms. Denise Lee. She is the Cyber Sitter Program Manager for the Air Force Research Air Information Directorate. Denise will provide a behind the scenes description of the technically private portion of today's events. Take it away, Denise. Thank you for that introduction, Steve, and good afternoon to all of you. I would like to begin by extending a special thank you to Ms. Laura Longo. Laura is a key member of the Cyber Sitter team here at the Information Directorate and has done countless things to make sure our program continues to thrive. To my leadership, thank you for affording me this opportunity and be being so supportive of this activity. In January, the Air Force released the Air Force 20.A Broad Agency Announcement for call the STTR proposals. This call was for the development of quantum technologies. The Air Force was seeking innovative technologies and or processes to advance the development of enabling technologies in quantum and also applications. This call was open to collaborative proposals and submissions to be performed through partnerships between industry and academia. Today's event marks the beginning of phase one contracting efforts for the STTR proposals. In all, 36 contact contractor proposals were selected and during private sessions, both today and tomorrow, these companies will present their ideas in one of the four topic areas to government source selection panels. These panels will make real time decisions to select or not select each company for award. Following these pitches, the Quantum Collider team will brief the final source selection results. Today, there is $5.4 million available for the STTR phase one project awards. And in FY21, $35 million is available for phase twos. Over the next few hours, you will hear the variety of speakers on topics including the United States Air Force Acquisition Strategy and understanding of government programs in quantum technology and how New York State is positioning for quantum research growth and other compelling quantum presentations. It is my great honor and true pleasure to kick off and welcome each and every one of you to the first ever United States Air Force Virtual Quantum Collider event. At this time, I would like to introduce one of the largest supporters of the Air Force Information Directorate Cyber Sitter Program. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to the AFRL Information Directorate's Director and Commander, Colonel Timothy Lawrence. My uh, distinct pleasure today is to introduce Dr. Roper, who is our uh, um, Air Force keynote speaker, and the main reason we're here today. Um, I just wanna say that uh, this meeting was supposed to be at Brooklyn Bridge at the Marriott for the exact same time frame as we were today. So we were able to transform this virtually. My whole thing as COVID started is that we need to keep the mission going as effectively as possible. So thanks to everyone out here, specifically the participants, <laughs> to supporting us as we roll forward. But for Dr. Roper, started uh, um, his career at the MIT Lincoln Labs, um, has his PhD from Oxford, um, became, uh, worked for the Missile Defense Agency, 
but then had significant contribution as the founding director of the Pentagon Strategic Capabilities Office, transforming it from a $50 million to $1.5 billion enterprise. He currently is the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics, and is serving as our service acquisition executive, is responsible for $60 billion of corporate enterprise money, overseeing 560 acquisition programs. And as he was here, as we've all said, and I, but it's very important to repeat, is when he was here, he said, Tim, you need to up your game. He saw our quantum portfolio and he saw programs that were 10, 20, 50 years out. And he says, the Air Force needs better. So hopefully this is a very small step in the right direction of giving us the Air Force and the nation the capability we need. So Dr. Roper, over to you. Thank you so much, sir, for being here. Dan, thank you so much for that introduction. And you know, and I think the fact that we've shown resiliency, being able to work these virtual events across the Air Force is gonna fundamentally change how we bring in a broader community of stakeholders to engage on important topics, not just to us, but to the country as a whole. And quantum technology is one of those topics. I imagine that across the United States today and potentially across the world, there are people tuning in that are at different parts of this quantum journey. Uh, they're either just people who are interested and wanna hear more about what could be on the forefront for the military of the nation, all the way to people that are deep principal investigators who are wanting to see their research take the next step and potentially partnering with the Air Force to do it. So no matter what walk along the quantum journey you are on, no matter what demographic you represent, welcome to this first event and Tim to you and your team at Rome Labs well done on pulling this off and exceptionally well done on pivoting to a virtual event so that we kept the same timeline on the calendar. So just let me congratulate you with that. If you wanna know what we're doing with this quantum collider event, we're trying to bring Q day for the Air Force and for the Pentagon as a whole faster than will happen normally. So Q day is, re is representative and symbolic of a broader issue we have with breakthrough technology is that we let it kind of boil from the, from the bottom up without ever putting a top down demand that says we must have this capability. We must accelerate it for our future war fighters, not because we know it, we know precisely what will happen on the battlefield when we do. It's typical of things that will be game changing that the history our future will write will not be the same one we forecast today. But if we're confident that something can change the game, we simply can't let that future be written by our adversaries. And when you look at what could be possible with quantum encryption, quantum communication, quantum sensing, quantum computing, we simply can't let that future be up in the air. But this is a hard technology. It's not gonna happen the way that we need it to by just letting it bubble from the bottom up. We have got to put some top-down guidance that's consistent and routine year after year. And so when you introduce me, Tim, most people uh, introduce me as the Air Force Service Acquisition Executive and Space Force Acquisition Executive now. And they mention the $60 billion of, of acquisition and procurement that I oversee. So the question that you might ask is why is $40 million that's on the table in this phase one and phase two event, why is 40 million so important when there's $60 billion of other things we could be doing? And that's because quantum is one of those potential game changers. And we have had a lot more activity focused on things like artificial intelligence and other buzzwords in the defense community. But we have not put enough demand signal on this technology. And what we hope to do in the Air Force and Space Force with Rome Labs leading the charge is to put year after year routine demand, routine challenges, and most importantly, routine funding to bring Q day, the day that we get that quantum technology over the goal line and into a warfighter's hand where we bring that earlier. And we need to do that across the board. We need AI day, we need quantum day, we need synthetic biology day. All of these days are things that have to be created with foresight and vision and then laying the groundwork and the necessary accelerants to get there. In the case of quantum technology, uh, this is an area that I think, I think it's suffered from the fact that, that about 
10 to 15 years ago, this technology was right around the corner, according to most. In fact, I remember very well as a undergraduate and a graduate at the Georgia Institute of Technology, having the quantum computing teams really try to court me into their area of scientific exploration as a place to do my postdoc, saying this is right around the corner. Quantum entanglement of billions of atoms had been demonstrated, and it was hypothesized that, hey, you know, the technology to be able to do this at scale is going to be here. It's going to change the world. And whether you wanted to build the computers or write the algorithms for them, uh, that was the hot area. But it didn't come as fast as people thought. This is a very difficult thing. We are trying to take what is very much a man-made construct, computing, algorithmic processing, and turn it into something that atoms and ions do. Uh, which is not which is not their make nor intent, and so the science has been challenging. The containment of the qubits has been challenging. The transport has been challenging, and as is so true in so many areas of breakthrough military technology, areas that we know so well from the past, like stealth, is that it's much harder than meets the eye, and there's no silver bullet that's going to turn the, the the approach, the path into one that's simple to walk. It's gonna take a diversity of technologies to do the qubit processing, to do transport of quantum information, uh, to formulate algorithms that can run efficiently on a hybridized system that may be doing trapped ions as well as photonics and have to blend these two technologies and maybe technologies we don't have today into something that can do computing in future. And the same thing is true for quantum sensing and quantum encryption, is that it's time to put the resource into place, the demand signal into place, and the vision into place, to say that whatever crosses the goal line first, we're ready for it. We're ready to be the customer. And that's why I'm excited uh, to kick off today's event and to put a little energy, a little top-down enthusiasm into this. I know that we're not going to reach Q day on my watch, most likely, although I would love, love, love to be wrong on that. And uh, I'll, I will come personally shake your hand when we are allowed to shake hands again, if you can prove me wrong on this. But I know it needs to happen. And as I uh, have mentioned in many of my talks uh, across our acquisition enterprise, planting seeds is something we've got to take as strategically important and one of the absolute necessities of our time in service, planting seeds that are not going to plant on our watch, that are not going to sprout and grow on our watch. Uh, this is a long-term competition, and technology, especially breakthrough ones, are at the base of whether we win or not. So I'm also very excited to highlight the STTTR, the Technology Transfer Account, uh, that hasn't gotten as much love recently from me as the SBIR, the Small Business Innovative Research Account, that we've been retooling into something we call Air Force Ventures that's trying to accelerate the pace at which commercial technology can enter our force, something the Pentagon has historically been bad at. And we want to win the race bringing technology of any kind into the military, uh, not just those that are built inside the military's laboratories. We need to treat every technology as a battlefield, every emerging market as a battlefield, because if our military doesn't get to use it first, then, then China's or Russia's or another military's might. And so we've been very focused with SBI, SBIR, Small Business Innovative Research, into treating applied commercial technology into a battlefield, showing we can bring it very quickly into the military. And that has been great for technologies like like additive manufacturing and uh, biological systems, medical systems, artificial intelligence, things that you know they're big dollars for in the private markets. And if we can just simply ride the wave, then we won't have to prop up these technologies and continue to sustain them under the military's dollars. And what does that do? Freeze up more dollars for innovation, which is exactly what we need to do. So over here on the STTR, we're talking about a very different kind of thing, more fundamental research, things that are still happening in, 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 in laboratories and fundamental research in universities across the country, and we're excited about that. I was so excited about the work that I saw up at Rome Lab. I was excited about getting to see a trapped ion with my naked eye, something that when I was going through school, 
it was told would probably never happen. And now look at how far the forefront of this technology has come. And I left thinking there's so much amazing technology. The photonics team was doing amazing work, an amazing public-private partnership, which I am all for in any field of tech with IBM about trying to make quantum computing more real, more tactile, exposing it to more users so that there's a broader industry base, a broader set of coders for quantum machines. But I thought we really need to organize around this. Uh, we need to show that we're not just open for business on very applied fields of technology that are de-risked, that are ready for commercial markets now, and we wanna make sure that the military gets access to them, that we are also ready to dig in and go on the long trek that it's going to take to make quantum technology real for the military. And so how many of these quantum colliders will we do? As many as we need to, to make that Q day for the military real. That day that we are not just fighting classically, we're fighting in a quantum world where probability is finally at our aid. I know that in accelerating this technology, if we wanna track what our velocity is year to year, that the more precisely we track that, the less precisely we'll know exactly where we are. And I, I fully encourage all types of quantum humor during the day today. Uh, it will help uh, make the virtual event go by smoother. Um, so if, 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 that, if that went past you, I apologize for that. But as a, as a reforming physicist and mathematician, I cannot help but throw a, a science joke in. And if you'll indulge me one more, I also want to encourage as much outside the box thinking as possible, which Schrodinger's cat is very happy about and is breathing a sigh of relief. Um, and there are several jokes in there. Again, none of them funny, but if you're a recovering scientist, you just can't help yourself. So I've been waiting. I've been waiting my whole time in this job to be able to use all of the physics training that I put in. Uh, and finally, it's a good day to be able to say it came in useful, if nothing more than for bad humor. Now, setting that humor aside, let's talk about what I hope will happen uh, during this event. The STTR count is about connecting investigators and in laboratories and universities with companies that are ready to work with them to help take cutting edge research and try to find a commercial and now a military market for it. We are excited to be that market. We are patient and the return on investment from this account because we know this is hard work. We know this is truly trying to tap into a fundamental power, that spooky side of physics that Einstein uh, so often referenced that just does not seem like the world that we live in, the world where, where, where we can predict what happens around us, where our brains are so good at predicting the way things propagate under Newtonian physics. But that has now hit a limitation. It has given us amazing computing capabilities, amazing sensing capabilities, amazing communication capabilities. But we've hit the end. And whether we squeak out a few more gains in Moore's Law is really not the point. It's worth doing, but turning in a different direction, an orthogonal direction, where the sky's the limit, and maybe not even the sky at that, that's the work we intend here. And so we are going to be patient in staying the course ensuring that the best ideas are not starved for research, that the ideas have a connection to a military problem that can keep the enthusiasm and sustained resource from year to year. And we promise to bring the same enthusiasm for transitioning fundamental research from laboratories and universities to companies, to bring that same enthusiasm from transitioning it from companies back into military systems so it can make a difference on problems that will make that will make an impact, whether now or in future. So I just wanna thank the entire Rome Lab team for taking on this challenge. Uh, it's a very easy thing for me to say, I want you to do this event. It's a very difficult thing to pull it off and be ready to back it up. But from the research I've seen up at Rome Labs, I am confident in their ability to make this the first of many excellent quantum colliders. So let me begin by thanking you for what you've done. For everyone attending, whatever you're here to accomplish, I hope you accomplish it. If it's for the good of our nation, our allies and partners and our military. Uh, this does not need to be the only collider that we do in areas of hard tech. Though we are going after commercial tech like gangbusters, we wanna to continue 
to be world leading researchers in the Air Force and now Space Force. And quantum is just one example of a place that we have got to be bold trailblazers and also mindful of the fact that this technology will cross over, is crossing over, has crossed over into the commercial space as well. So I want to thank you as well. Finally, uh, as we get through uh, the pitches and announcements, I want to uh, ahead of time congratulate all those that are selected. Thank you for being the guinea pigs of this. We don't want this to be business as usual. We want your selection to really highlight that we see something of exceptional value in what we're proposing. I hope that as we get through uh, the events this week, I hope that I'll have time to to get some briefings, some out briefs from my team, as well as some of the researchers and companies here to hear how things went, to hear how we can improve it, and ultimately ensure that when we put out a call for good ideas, that working with the Air Force is as easy as the apple pie that we often say we're here to defend. Thank you again. I'm happy to take a few questions in the little bit of time we have, if we're able to do that. And if we're not able to, I'll just hand it back to my team and say, I can't wait to see the outputs of this week. Dr. Roper, thank you so much for taking the time today and for your perspective. We would love to ask some questions if you have a few more minutes. We do have some coming in from the audience. I do, and uh, the IT gods are smiling on us, so uh, let's keep going. <laughs> Fantastic, okay. Here comes one. What efforts are underway to recruit people into the advanced computational fields Math is being taught as if it's a dead language. What do you say to that? Well, I, I ultimately, <laughs> I ultimately did my uh, dissertation in mathematics, so I, uh, I didn't realize I would have eventually, uh, you know, be a student of a dead language. And so, um, look, we cannot, if we're competing against China, if we truly are, the place I'll know we're really serious is when we take it all the way back into education in this nation, which is outside of our purview in the Defense Department. But certainly within our purview is the talent that we recruit and how we approach STEM. And so, yes, we need to change how we recruit and the areas of, of scientific investigation that we emphasize. Uh, we still need mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. We still build fancy airplanes and satellites that in, no one else in the world can build in many cases. But we need a lot of new fields. Uh, computer science is increasingly important. Uh, machine learning and AI is just simply its own field now. It, it, it has sprung off from computer science. And now in many schools, it's its own discipline. We need to treat it the same way. We're looking for a highly sought after skill set. We will need a new model. We will need a faster hiring process. We will need to start clearances faster so people don't twiddle their thumbs when they get on the books. We need, frankly, we need a complete overhaul of how we approach talent. And that's going to include not just uh, the fields that we go after, it, it includes treating diversity differently. And as I look at this nation and I look at what advantages China has, China has a nationalized industrial base and they have a nationalized educational system. They're able to get the talent that they need to support their military and to support their economy. We need to break down every barrier for working with us. Uh, we can't treat diversity, and especially in terms of recruiting talent and promoting talent, we can't just treat it as a side duty. It's gonna be fundamental to getting the right brains, the right minds at the right places at the right time so that innovation remains the way that we stay dominant. We're not going to be able to match a country like China in bulk. Their GDP will at least double ours uh, in future. So if it's going to double ours, then how do we keep up? We keep up by being a better innovator, by continuing to disrupt the system to change the game. And we only do that with the right people in place. So it is such an important thing. And I, I feel like it's something that um, if, if we don't up our game on it, especially in areas of fundamental research, I don't know when we'll lose, but I know we will, simply because we're not restocking the deck at the same rate we're depleting it. Great answer. Thank you for that. Got another one for you. You made reference to Q Day in your remarks. Could you explain that, please? Sure. No, I mean, any initiative, you need, a, you need an organizing construct, something that's easy to say, easy to remember. Uh, the military is a horrible brand or a marketer. Uh, so I often try to think for things like this, what is one easy concept 
that we can wrap our heads around is that we, we, we don't, we're not just here to just talk about quantum, the fun stuff in quantum, to leave with talking points and PowerPoint slides that we shouldn't be making anymore in the military. It takes up way too much of our time uh, that we could be putting back into competing and winning. We're not just here to do that. That is the noise in the system. We're here to organize everything around a single organizational construct, which is driving the lowest hanging application of quantum technology into the military's hands to demystify it, to get dirt on it, to get it out in the field, to understand what delineates it, and then to create the demand for more. And without pushing and pulsing the system with events like the Quantum Collider, and then stepping back and working back from a date we believe that crossover day could occur, it's likely not going to happen. And so one of the things I'm gonna be working with the lab and, and leaders across the country in quantum science is uh, when do we want to set that target? And you know me, I'm okay with scaling. I'm okay with an aggressive goal that we don't reach as long as the aggressive goal does good for creating tension and urgency. I think we need to set QDA. And part of what I'm looking for coming out of this quantum collider is uh, how far out does it need to be? And whatever day I'm told, I'll ask, why can't I bring it further to the left? And that certainly keeps us uh, busy and on our toes to support those types of events. <laughs> We do have uh, another question, if you have a few more moments, sir. All right. How do you see events like this being able to accelerate the development of quantum technologies, as well as being able to catalyze the small business community? Great. Well, first of all, I just saw a note pop up from, a, from an undergraduate that's tuning in. The fact that you're tuning in, that, that's what gives me hope. So we can't just start off this focused on the kind of research that only principal investigators, the leading professors at major institutes can do. We need to take things we're interested in all the way in to undergraduate work, even into high school and middle school. So I'm gonna be asking a lot of room. If we're gonna lead the way in, uh, in quantum technology, how are we targeting undergraduates? What kind of research are we sponsoring? What about graduate research? Are we doing high school STEM? Are we bringing education into middle schools? How do we make it so clear that if you think that the spooky quantum science stuff is awesome, uh, you know, the fact that you can be in two places at once, which is kind of what this, this IT uh, makes it feel like. I guess, I guess we kind of are until someone looks at us and then we actually have to be in one place, even if it's virtually. And that kind of feels like that's true in the quantum world. So the fact that, that we could inspire people and, and make them feel like if they want that to be their career and they want to work towards these culminating events like Q-Day, that they should come work in the United States Air Force and Space Force, that historically we have taken on big challenges, and we still do. We're just a little bad about classifying them. We need to bring more of this stuff out into the light where we can safely so that we continue to get the right talent to come help us push the ball forward. Great. We have time for one more if you do, sir. I do. All right, great. What other emerging but strategically important technologies do you envision that could benefit from collider events? Sure, even though we've got a lot of work in AI, we need it uh, because um, we're not just interested in applying artificial intelligence, machine learning as it exists today. We really need the next generation that's, that's auditable and presumes an adversary. So AI is very fragile from a military standpoint because, you know, the phones and IT devices we're all dialing in on uh, with all sorts of amazing uh, analytics that are cloud-based backing them up. Uh, there's not the kind of adversary will face intentionally trying to screw up the convolutional neural nets that make them happen. And we need an AI that can deal with that adversary. We need an R2-D2 that's truly suspicious of the data that's coming in. So that's an area I think we could drive research. Um, I think synthetic biology is, and is, a, is an area that we really need to, to take a, a hard look. We tend not to go big into biology in the Air Force, but I'll tell you, shifting things into biology that we, that we formally did with mechanical systems or electrical, uh, who knows what advances we'll find. And I've seen some amazing work on biologically inspired materials and sensors and even computing, which makes me think, well, as we work on quantum computing, 
maybe biological computing is, is a way that we could fill the gap, or maybe it'll have advantages that a quantum computer won't reach for many years, if at all. So that's another area. Gene editing, again, something that we don't look at uh, in the Pentagon. We think of that as a, as a health thing. But, uh, you know, it seems like with computer science and, and biology, genetics starting to collide, that the intersection provides some potential amazing breakthroughs for science that we need to be uh, cognizant of what they could be. It's kind of like cheating on Mother Nature's test. It's, it's a technology that, that we, we haven't earned ourselves. We're not able to make, you know, materials at that level. Like if, if you know, if I, you know, if I told you, you know, if, I, if I were to describe the characteristics of a house fly to you um, as if it was a United States Air Force drone, you would say there's no, that technology is so far and, you know, there's no way you can make it because, you know, the flying around, the sensing, the landing, yeah, we can do that kind of stuff. Uh, the miniaturization, how long it lasts, drawing energy from its environment, the replicate. I mean, all of a sudden you realize this is a technology that's far beyond what we have the fundamental ability to create ourselves. So it truly is like cheating on Mother Nature's test. So if you, if, if, if you can cheat off that test, an adversary can as well. And one thing that, that's going to be a challenge for us in the U.S. in the realm of fundamental research is that we have high, high ethics standards, and we should. And I would not want to live in a nation or a country where we didn't. Uh, but that's going to create a challenge against nations that don't. And so we're going to have to work harder, and we're going to have to be better innovators. And so I could keep going on and on. There are so many breakthrough technology, potential breakthrough technologies that we ought to be like, like frightened every day that the bread and butter of the military we've been inherited could just become a completely different thing, be obsolete because in future, you know, we don't make military systems out of the same thing. So, and I think that frightens us because we've had such a good run uh, with dominance, with the systems everyone knows and loves, the the bombers, the fighters, the satellites. And they're amazing and, I mean, unquestionably dominant. And if we shed the fear that tomorrow's service might look fundamentally different, then we'll get back to our roots of just loving whatever the new technology is, whatever it is, whatever breakthroughs it gives, whatever advantages it bequeaths. We'll find a way to operationalize them for advantage on the battlefield. And if we go beyond that and we find a way to operationalize them that also helps the U.S., in the case of this quantum event, we don't want to just move the ball for the military. The idea of making Q-Day happen is to bring quantum technology closer for the nation. And if the military is the first adopter because of either price or scale, whatever it is, we, we tend to have an easier first fit for many areas of fundamental tech. I hope that will move the ball forward for the nation as well. So, you know, Q-Day for the military hopefully brings Q-Day for the nation earlier as well. That's the kind of thinking that will help us win long term. And events like today are just one step in how we should be achieving this every day, everywhere, all the time. I'm very proud to be a part of this one. Thank you to everyone that has been a part of it, and best of luck with your event. Dr. Roper, thank you so much for your time today. On behalf of the entire team here, we Greatly appreciate your support and for you taking the time out today to talk a little about quantum. Thank you so much. Hope you can stick around for a little bit and listen to some of the other presenters. Okay, thank you. Next up, we have Dr. John Preskill. Dr. Preskill's background is in particle physics and quantum field theory, but currently he investigates the possibility of solving otherwise intractable problems by exploiting quantum physics. Dr. Preskill is an American theoretical physicist and the Richard P. Feynman Professor of Theoretical Physics at the California Institute of Technology. There he is also the director of the Institute for Quantum Information and Matter. Please join me in welcoming the person forever remembered that made quantum computing a reality, Dr. John Preskill. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this event today. I'm a professor of physics, and I work in the field of quantum information science. Next. 
This field is a synthesis of three of the great themes of 20th century science, quantum physics, computer science, and information theory, which is opening new opportunities in basic science, but also may point towards a revolutionary future technology. Next. This is a broad field. It encompasses quantum strategies for improving sensing, protecting our privacy using quantum states, distributing quantum states on a global scale, and also using quantum simulators and quantum computers to solve hard problems. All of these topics are relevant to the mission of the Air Force, but in this talk I'm going to focus on quantum simulation and quantum computing. Next. The way I look at this field as a scientist is that we're in the early stages of the exploration of a new frontier of the physical sciences. For decades, if we wanted to probe more deeply into the properties of elementary particles, we would build a more powerful particle accelerator. Or if we wanted to learn more about the very early history of the universe, we would build more powerful instruments and telescopes. And now we are acquiring and perfecting the tools to create and precisely control very complex states of many particles, opening a frontier of complexity. These are highly entangled quantum states, so complex that we can't simulate them with our most powerful digital supercomputers or predict how they'll behave very well with existing theoretical tools. And that's opening new opportunities for science discovery. In the future, if we want to probe more deeply into the properties of highly complex quantum states, we'll build more powerful quantum computers. Next. Now, our confidence that this frontier will be fruitful to explore rests mainly on two main concepts, quantum complexity, which is our reason for thinking that quantum computers will be powerful, and quantum error correction, which is our basis for believing that quantum computers can be scaled up to large systems that can solve hard problems. Next. And both of those concepts build on the underlying idea of quantum entanglement. That's the word that we use for the characteristic correlations among parts of a quantum system, which are very different from the correlations we normally encounter. You might imagine a book which is 100 pages long, and if it's an ordinary book written in bits, Every time you read another page of the book, you learn another 1% of its content. And after you've read all the pages one by one, you know everything that's in the book. But imagine instead that it's a quantum book written in qubits instead of ordinary bits with the pages highly entangled with one another. Then when we look at the pages one at a time, we see only random gibberish, which reveals essentially nothing to distinguish one entangled book from another. And even if we've read all of the pages one by one, we know essentially nothing about the content of the book. And that's because in the quantum book, the information is encoded almost entirely not in the individual pages, but in how the pages are correlated with one another. So in order to read the book, we have to make a collective observation of many pages at once. That's the essence of quantum entanglement. And it's a very different notion of correlation than we encounter in ordinary experience. Next. And what's so interesting about these correlations is that they're extremely complex to describe in terms of ordinary classical information. That's what we mean by quantum complexity. If I wanted to give a complete description of all the correlations among just a few hundred qubits in terms of classical language, I would have to write down more bits than the number of atoms in the visible universe. And that's never going to be possible. Now, that in itself doesn't necessarily mean that quantum computers can do interesting things. Next. So we have several reasons for expecting that quantum computers will be powerful and useful. For one thing, we know of some problems which are believed to be hard for ordinary classical computers, which quantum computers will be able to solve efficiently. The best known example is finding the prime factors of large composite integers. 
And we think factoring is hard because really smart people have been trying for decades to come up with better factoring algorithms, but still no efficient classical method is known, while we do know of a quantum algorithm that can solve the problem efficiently. But perhaps most tellingly, we don't know how to simulate what a quantum computer does in general using any classical digital computer. And that's not for lack of trying. For decades, physicists and chemists have been trying to come up with better methods for describing how quantum systems behave, but still the best algorithms that we currently have in the worst case have a runtime which rises exponentially with the size of the computer, that is, with its number of qubits. Now, that doesn't mean that the power of quantum computing is unlimited. We don't expect, for example, that a quantum computer will be able to efficiently find an exact solution to hard optimization problems, like NP hard problems. Next. Now, it's a compelling question to understand what are these problems which are easy for quantum computers and hard for classical ones. Next. And we've learned a lot about that over the last 25 years. I think we still have a great deal more to learn. Next. If you are a physicist, there's a natural place to look for hard problems, and that's the problem of trying to understand the behavior of quantum systems. 20 years ago, two great physicists, Bob Laughlin and David Pines, made the point that we really have a theory of everything that matters for ordinary life. It's the theory, the equation that describes the behavior of electrons interacting electromagnetically with one another and with atomic nuclei that underlies all of chemistry and materials and so on. And we know with great precision what that equation is, but we can't solve it when there are more than a few electrons involved. And they went so far as to say no computer existing or that will ever exist can break this barrier. And they noted the irony that although we have a complete theory of everything that matters in ordinary life, that theory has revealed exactly nothing about many things of great importance. And by things of importance, uh, they meant situations in which quantum entanglement has an essential role. Next. Now, in fact, nearly 20 years before Laughlin and Pines made this statement, the physicist Richard Feynman had articulated a rebuttal of sorts when he said nature isn't classical, and if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. Feynman foresaw that if we wanted to study quantum problems efficiently, we would need to use quantum computing technology. Next. Now, for a physicist like Feynman, what seems especially important about quantum computing is that we expect that with a quantum computer, we'd be able to efficiently simulate any process that occurs in nature. And we don't think that's true of ordinary digital computers, which are unable to efficiently simulate very highly entangled matter. And that means with a quantum computer, we should be able to probe more deeply into the properties of complex molecules and exotic materials, and also study fundamental physics in new ways by, for example, simulating the high energy collisions of elementary particles, or the quantum behavior of a black hole, or the conditions in the early universe right after the Big Bang. In fact, the name of this event, Virtual Quantum Collider, is very evocative for me because one of my research interests is, with quantum computers, what will we be able to learn by simulating high energy collisions of fundamental particles? In other words, what will we do with a virtual quantum collider? Next. Now, in defense of Laughlin and Pines, who dismissed Feynman's idea as impractical, here we are nearly 40 years after Feynman called for the launch of the field of quantum computing and after much effort and investment, we're just now getting to the stage where quantum computers are beginning to become capable of doing interesting things. Why is it taking so long? Because quantum computing is really hard. 
And it's hard because we want a device which can simultaneously satisfy a set of desiderata which are nearly incompatible with one another. On the one hand, we want qubits to interact strongly with one another so we can process the information that they encode. But we also want to keep the qubits well isolated from the environment because interactions with the environment can cause errors in the computation. Yet we do want to be able to control the qubits from the outside and at the end of a computation, measure them to read out a result. And it's very hard to develop a platform that satisfies all of these criteria, and it's only after decades of developments and materials and qubit design and control protocols that we've been able to get as far as we have. Next. Now, why is it so important to keep our qubits isolated from the environment? It's because of a phenomenon that we call decoherence. Physicists like to fancifully imagine that poor cat who is simultaneously alive and dead, but we never see that type of superposition of macroscopically distinguishable states of an object in the ordinary world. And we understand why that's the case. It's because a real cat inevitably interacts with its surroundings and those interactions with the environment cause in effect, the cat to be measured by the environment and the measurement uh, projects the cat onto a state which is either completely dead or completely alive. That's the phenomenon that we call decoherence. And in fact, decoherence helps us to understand why even though Quantum physics holds sway at the atomic scale. Nevertheless, classical physics provides a very accurate description of what we experience in everyday life. Next. Now, a quantum computer, though not otherwise much like a cat, will also inevitably interact with its surroundings, even though we may try hard to prevent that. And those interactions with the environment will drive decoherence and cause the computer to crash so that errors will occur. So it's only by somehow protecting the quantum computer from decoherence and other sources of error that we can operate a large scale quantum computer successfully. Next. So really, the essence of the problem is a fundamental difference between ordinary classical information and quantum information, which is that we can't observe a quantum state without disturbing it in some irreversible way. And so that means we have to prevent the environment from learning anything about the state of the qubits while they're being processed, or else the computer will behave like a classical one and it will lose its magical powers. So we have to keep the quantum computer nearly perfectly isolated from the outside world. And that sounds impossible because our hardware is never going to be perfect. Next. But we've understood in principle how to do it using the idea we call quantum error correction. And the main concept of quantum error correction is that if we want to protect this delicate quantum information, we should encode it in a very highly entangled form of a system with many parts so that the encoded state like that 100 page book I referred to earlier will have the property if you look at part of the system as the environment typically does the information carried by the system the information in the book will still remain concealed because it doesn't reside in the individual pages and we've also understood how to process information that's encoded in this highly entangled form, and so to operate a fault-tolerant, error-protected quantum computation. Next. Now, the fundamental unit of a quantum computer, a quantum bit or qubit, can be realized physically in many different ways. It can be carried by a single photon or a single atom or a single electron. 
Those are all quite remarkable encodings because the information is carried by a single particle. And yet we've learned, thanks to technological advances over the last couple of decades, how to control that information quite precisely. Or the qubit can be encoded in a much more complex system, like, for example, an electrical circuit at very low temperature that conducts electricity without resistance. And that's also a remarkable encoding because the qubit involves the collective motion of billions of electrons, and yet for information processing purposes, it behaves as though it were a single atom. Now, all of these technological approaches to qubit technology are advancing steadily, and it's important that they continue to advance each has its own characteristics, strengths, and weaknesses. They may have complementary applications, and the truth is we just don't know at this point what qubit technology has the best long-term prospects for scalability to large systems. Next. So where are we now? Arguably, we have reached what has been called quantum computational supremacy. Next. This uh, milestone was announced with some fanfare in a paper published last fall by the Google Group. And what the Google Quantum Group announced next was that they had built, oh, sorry. Um, so what is this idea of quantum computational supremacy? The idea is that we believe that there's a fundamental difference between quantum and classical, that Quantum systems cannot simulate, sorry, classical systems cannot simulate quantum systems efficiently. I think that's one of the most interesting things that's ever been said about the difference between quantum and classical. And there's a very strong incentive to validate that in laboratory experiments to the extent that we can. Next. The Google group built a system with 53 working qubits laid out in a two-dimensional array where entangling quantum gates can be performed on neighboring qubits in the array. And they performed circuits of gates with up to 20 layers of entangling gates and read out the results by measuring all the qubits. Now, these qubits are noisy, and so there's very poor signal to noise if you run that computation just once. But they were able to run it millions of times in just a few minutes in order to get statistically significant, verifiable results. If you were trying to simulate what this device does, a device they call Sycamore, using a classical supercomputer, it would, by some estimates, take at least days, by other estimates, much longer to do the simulation, yet the quantum computer does it in just minutes. I call this quantum David versus classical Goliath because the quantum computer is just a single chip inside a single dilution refrigerator in a tabletop laboratory, whereas the competing classical supercomputer occupies the size of two basketball courts and consumes megawatts of power. Furthermore, as we add additional qubits, the classical cost of simulating the uh, quantum computer grows exponentially, essentially doubles every time we add an additional qubit. So the conclusion seems to be that the quantum computing technology is working at a scale where it's hard to simulate its operation using any classical system. Next. So significantly, this is a programmable quantum computer which in principle, if we could continue to add qubits and could keep the noise under control, would be capable of performing any quantum computation. It's an impressive achievement in experimental physics, a testament to the ongoing progress that's being made in building quantum computing hardware that this demonstration was a success. So arguably, we're entering the regime where the extravagant exponential resources of the quantum world can be validated. That's not really a surprise. But it's a technological milestone for planet Earth, which we should acknowledge. We know that building a quantum computer is really, really hard, but it seems not to be so ridiculously hard that we can continue to make progress. And now 
we're at the stage where we can begin thinking seriously about applications of the technology. But the particular task which was performed by Sycamore for the purpose of demonstrating quantum computational supremacy is not itself particularly useful. Next. I thought it would be useful to have a word for the era which is now dawning in quantum technology, so I made up a word, NISC, N-I-S-Q. It stands for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum. The intermediate scale is supposed to convey that we now have systems which are sufficiently large, over 50 qubits, that we can't, by brute force, simulate what the quantum device does, even with our most powerful existing supercomputers. But noisy reminds us that these devices are not error corrected, and the noise in the qubits and the gates limits their computational power. It was because of the noise that Google wasn't able to perform a circuit with more than 20 layers of entangling gates. Now, for physicists, NISC is really quite exciting. It means that we have the opportunity now to explore the behavior of highly entangled quantum systems in a regime which has never been experimentally accessible before. And it may be that there will be useful applications of broader interests in the near term, but we're really not sure about that. We shouldn't think of NISC as something that's going to change the world by itself right away. Really, it's a step towards more powerful quantum technologies that we're hoping to develop in the future. I actually am confident that eventually quantum computers will have a big impact on society, but that impact might still be decades away. We don't really know how long it's going to take to get there. Next. There's a kind of emerging paradigm of how we might use a quantum processor in the near term for problem solving, a kind of hybrid quantum classical scheme. It makes sense to use our classical supercomputers to the extent that we can, and then to boost the power with a quantum coprocessor. It might work this way, that we perform a relatively modest scale quantum computation, measure all the qubits, and then feed those measurement results to a classical computer, which returns instructions for slightly modifying the quantum computation. And then that cycle can be iterated until convergence with the goal of finding a minimum of some cost function for the purpose of solving an optimization problem. Well, as I remarked, we don't expect that quantum computers will be able to find exact solutions to the hard instances of hard optimization problems. But as far as we know, it's possible that they'll be able to find approximate solutions where the approximations are better or to find approximate solutions faster, at least we can't rule that out. Now, should we expect that these NISC devices in the near term will be able to outperform our best classical methods for some optimization task? Well, we don't really know. We're gonna to have to try it and see how well it works, but it's really a lot to ask because these quantum, uh, rather classical optimizers are well honed after decades of development and the quantum NISC processors are just becoming available for the first time now. But we'll be able to experiment with them and see how well they do. Next. Now we don't necessarily have to be so discouraged that theorists are not able to guarantee that NIST technology will have important applications. There are many instances in classical computing where algorithms turned out to be useful in practice, even though Theorists were not able to validate their usefulness in advance. A uh, current example is deep learning, which is having a huge impact. But really, theorists have a very limited understanding of why, for some purposes of practical interest, deep learning networks can be efficiently trained. It may be kind of like that for a while in quantum computing. We have a number of heuristic algorithms that we'd like to try, approaches to optimization, machine learning, and so on. But we don't really have compelling arguments that with NIST technology, we'll be able to improve on classical methods, but we'll play around, see how well we can do, and as we experiment and learn more, maybe come closer to real applications. But in the next few years, at least, we expect to be limited to something like hundreds of qubits and circuit depth, number of layers of entangling gates, less than 100 or so because of the noise in the devices, and we may have to get lucky to find real applications. It will require, in any case, 
a vibrant dialogue between the application users and the algorithm experts. Next. Now, as I said, these NIST devices will not be protected by quantum error correction, and we think in the long run to solve very hard problems with quantum computers, quantum error correction will be needed to overcome the limitations from noise in the hardware. The catch is that quantum error correction has a very high cost, overhead cost, in terms of the number of qubits and the gates that we need. How high that cost is depends on the quality of our hardware and the problem we're trying to solve. But for example, if we wanted to solve a chemistry problem today that surpasses what we can do with classical supercomputers, we probably need hundreds of very well protected logical qubits. And to protect each qubit, we'd have to encode it redundantly in hundreds or thousands of physical qubits. So probably millions of physical qubits would be needed. Another example is that quantum computers, in principle, can break widely used public key crypto systems. But if we assume an error rate per gate of one in a thousand, which is about six times uh, better than the error rate uh, found by uh, the Google experiment, uh, to perform that factoring task, it's estimated that we need 20 million physical qubits. So to get to applications like that, we're going to have to cross a wide chasm from where we're likely to be in the next few years with hundreds of physical qubits to millions, and that's likely to take a while. But in the meantime, we should be continuing to try to advance the qubit gate technology, improving the error rates, as well as find better algorithms, error correction protocols, systems engineering approaches, and so on, to bring us closer to the era of a really fully fault-tolerant, scalable quantum computer. Next. Now, one uh, vision is that we might be able to build hardware with far lower gate error rates, which would be a huge step forward for the technology. There's a theoretical idea of how to do that called topological quantum computing, which Microsoft has been investing in. From a theorist perspective, this is a very beautiful idea where the error correction is really embedded in the design of the hardware itself. In the long run, this might be the right approach. But so far, progress has been quite slow. And part of the reason for that is that there are daunting materials issues that need to be addressed. And progress in materials takes a lot of investment and typically a lot of time. Next. I think Feynman was right when he envisioned that with quantum devices solving problems in quantum physics, uh, we would eventually see a huge impact from the technology. It's likely that the implications for chemistry alone can lead to big advances in uh, energy production, in agriculture, in human health, in the sustainability of the planet, and so on. But those very impactful applications may still be some time off, uh, won't really occur until the era of truly scalable quantum computing incorporating air correction. I am fairly optimistic, though, that in the next five or 10 years, using our digital quantum computers and also special purpose analog quantum devices, we can make advances in scientific discovery, uh, investigating the properties of complex quantum systems, how they evolve, how they approach thermal equilibrium, and so on. So it's a very exciting scientific frontier, but I don't know how long it's going to be before broadly impactful applications are actually realized. Next. In other words, we have to remember that quantum computing is a marathon, uh, not a sprint. I think Dr. Roper said that we need to plant the seeds, which won't necessarily sprout on our watch. And I think that's the right sentiment. There are huge uh, technological problems, challenges that we have to address. I think there are no insurmountable obstacles, and we will realize very powerful quantum technology at some point in the future, but mainstream users might have to be patient. Next. So to sum up what I've said, the demonstration of quantum computational supremacy seems to confirm the extravagant computational resources that the quantum world
provides, we're entering the NISC era of quantum computing, an era of heuristic quantum algorithms. Uh, I think this will lead to scientific advances and it will give us an opportunity to try out heuristic ideas towards applications of broader interests. And those might be found, but we can't guarantee it. Truly scalable quantum computing incorporating quantum error correction most likely will be needed for really impactful applications in the future, but that has a very high overhead cost and it's not likely to be feasible in the relatively near term. It's important to continue to advance the qubit technology and lower the error rate per gate in quantum hardware that will improve the reach of the NIST technology and eventually it will lower the overhead costs of quantum error correction and bring us closer to a truly scalable technology. So we shouldn't think of NISC as something that's going to change the world by itself. Realistically, the goal for the near-term platforms we're developing should be to pave the way for bigger payoffs in the future uh, using devices yet to be developed. And progress towards a fault-tolerant error-corrected quantum technology has to continue to command our attention. So I think it's an exciting time for quantum information science. And I think if we invest the effort uh, over decades to continue to develop the technology, we will be very amply rewarded. So thanks a lot for listening and I'd be happy to take questions. Dr. Preskill, thank you so much uh, for that perspective. We do have time for a question if you have another moment. I do. Okay. Will reducing error rates require hardware and materials that are not yet widely available? Um, well, you know, I'm not sure. Um, the, so far, the pace in which qubit uh, error rates have improved in some of the technologies and particularly the uh, superconducting uh, technologies has been impressive with something like a uh, factor of 10 improvement every uh, three years in the storage times and the coherence times. But I, that's starting to stall. And I think um, the qubit technology in the case of superconducting circuits, which has served the community well, for uh, 10 plus years, uh, maybe coming to the end of the road. So part of what we're going to need is to try different designs and that could lead to significant improvements in error rates, even without big advances in materials. But materials are certainly also a limitation and understanding the basic science of the materials limitations in the um, solid state uh, devices is going to be important. Now, in the case of trapped ions, where the qubits are atoms which are very stable with respect to decoherence, in fact, these are the same atoms we use in some of the world's best clocks, the qubits themselves are very robust and they have very long coherence times and the problem is controlling the qubits and performing high fidelity gates in a large device. And that's partly an engineering problem that uh, involves control technology and not so much a materials issue. Though there too, materials are one source of error in those devices. It seems though that if we just run them cold, they're usually run at room temperature now, that will reduce the uh, materials uh, contribution to the um, decoherence. And so I would say with uh, the trapped ions, probably materials are not the critical thing to forward progress. For topological quantum computing, it's very much uh, a materials issue. Uh, I think for spin qubits, materials are also uh, quite important. Um, and uh, it's, materials will help, but it's not uh, enough by itself. Great. Thank you, Dr. Presco. That I think that's a good question to wrap up on. We greatly appreciate you dialing in today, videoing in, providing your perspective, uh, and uh, thank you so much. We're going to take a short 10-minute break. Uh, please stay tuned, and we'll be back 
with an exciting lineup of speakers, including Mr. Jack Blackhurst, Mr. David Shahady, and Dr. Michael Hayda. Plus, later on, we'll have some exciting news to share regarding future quantum science events and how you can get involved. In addition, be on the lookout during the break for a couple of live poll questions. We'll see you back here in a few minutes. Next up, we have Mr. Jack Blackhurst, Executive Director of the Air Force Research Laboratory. Mr. Blackhurst is the Principal Assistant to the Commander and the Senior Civilian Executive responsible for managing the Air Force's $2.5 billion science and technology program, along with an additional $2.3 billion of externally funded research and development. He serves a government workforce of approximately 6,000 people in the laboratory's nine component technology directorates, of which seven are represented here today, and the 711th Human Performance Wing. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Blackhurst. The floor is yours. Okay, can you everyone hear me? We can. Good, great. Uh, so first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak at this opportunity. This is one of those exciting things that's happening in the world today, uh, as well as uh, Air Force Research Laboratory. There's really three messages as I want to communicate today. The first one is uh, the whole experience today that uh, those of you that are experiencing the, uh, the pitch day concept is something relatively new. You know, uh, Dr. Roper, I'm sure, talked about this this morning, but, you know, he started this idea about a year ago, and he had two objectives. The, the, the objectives were very simple. Number one is tie our small business innovation research, um, innovative research uh, budget to war, uh, warfighters' needs. Uh, and second of all, get the money to the uh, users very quickly. Um, and so I think this pitch day concept that we established uh, <clears throat> about a year ago, like I said, in New York City, has kind of caught on as a new way of doing business. And so for those of you that are listening out there that haven't played in a pitch day, I would say, you know, try it out. Uh, the whole idea is, is to bring talented folks together, put together proposals, um, and we use these for our SIBR phase ones and phase twos, uh, and it's been extremely successful. Uh, and I think the other success uh, part of that is the fact that uh, a lot of folks that normally wouldn't have worked with the government are trying it out and being successful. Um, so I think that's the first point I wanted to make today was is you know, we're trying something out new here. Uh, it seems to be very effective, uh, and it's bringing a whole new uh, source of vendors and um, researchers and businesses uh, and universities to the table that perhaps wouldn't have thought about working for the U.S. government and or the Air Force. Uh, and so we've been very pleased with that. Um, and so if you haven't participated in activity, I would say try it. The second point I'd like to make is, is that um, you're going to hear a lot today about uh, quantum technology from a, a variety of experts. Um, the point I'd like to make is, is that about a year or so ago, we were in the mode of watching. So we kind of, uh, uh, you know, used the uh, paradigm of uh, take action, leverage, or watch uh, technology activities. Um, and uh, about a year, maybe a little longer than a year, um, our senior leadership asked us where we were investing in quantum technology. And at that particular point in time, it was, uh, it was a watch item. Uh, our, perspe our perspective on that was is there's a lot of commercial industries, there's a lot of commercial activity out there that is spending, you know, millions and billions of dollars to develop quantum communications and computers and networks and, and the like, and that we ought to be leveraging that versus uh, investing in ourselves. Um, and so what we did was, is we said, okay, let's take a look at this. Let's take a closer look at that and see where we ought to be investing. And so we actually did some further study. Uh, we actually had a, a day-long uh, offsite with our uh, senior leaders in the Air Force um, and decided those areas that we needed to invest in were, yes, there's lots of activity going on in communications uh, and in terms of uh, com computers out there in the quantum world. Uh, but we decided that uh, our focus within the United States Air Force and Air Force Research Laboratory should be to take advantage of that leveraging capability in the communications, computers, and networks, uh, but also to focus on those things which are very near and dear to the government's uh, 
uh, mission, and that is, is position navigation timing, uh, clocks, uh, and, and the like, uh, including materials and artificial intelligence and a variety of other technologies that you might combine with uh, the um, um, quantum technologies. And, you know, we view quantum as an enabler. It's not a weapon system per se, but it's clearly an enabler that combined with other technologies can provide a significant advantage to a warfighter. Um, and so since that particular time, we have relooked at our investment and reprioritized investment in those particular areas, like I said, comm networks, computers, materials, AI, and uh, uh, PNT, and timing and clocks. Um, and so we're kind of focusing on those particular areas that the traditional commercial market wouldn't sink their teeth into or wouldn't spend a lot of money. Um, and so what we're interested in are proposals uh, that, that follow in those particular categories. The last item I'd like to talk about is essentially is um, the fact that the entire laboratory is engaged in quantum technology. Sometimes we think of certain techno te uh, technology directorates that might be primary investing in the quantum technologies, but you'll find that um, there are folks at Rome, New York, our folks at the Sensors Directorate here at Wright-Patterson, Materials Directorate, our folks at uh, Space Vehicles Directorate down in Kirtland Air Force Base, and you can go on and on. And I think there's the, almost all of the directors are represented today. Um, and um, as we look at quantum and we look at an enterprise solution um, uh, across AFRL, you can see that it's not one single technology directorate. There are various aspects of quantum, and you'll hear about that all today in the various talks. Um, but the point I wanted you to make was, is don't think that one particular directorate within AFRL is leading the charge in terms of, of um, uh, encompassing all of our research dollars within quantum technologies. That it is a shared uh, activity, um, and that we look across the entire uh, AFRL portfolio as we bring our technology directorates to the table. Um, so with that, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you um, and hope that you have a, a good rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Blackhurst. We appreciate your time today. Coming up next, I'd like to welcome Ms. Anissa Lumpkin, the Air Force Research Laboratory Sibber Sitter Program Lead, who will introduce our next speaker. In her role, Ms. Lumpkin oversees the Sitter portfolio of projects and is a leading a variety of new initiatives to improve the re program's return on investment. Thanks for joining us, Ms. Lumpkin. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. Hi, as Dr. Roper mentioned earlier today, it's all about planting seeds. Uh, with the Air Force Civil Civil Center Program is offering new partnerships for networking, matchmaking, proposal writing, and more to support the development of technology. At the forefront of our leadership in our Air Force Civil Center Center of Excellence is Mr. Shahidi, also looking at strategic initiatives with HBCUs, Appalachian universities, and more projects that are coming up to address our underserved communities. Mr. David Shahidi directs a research and development budget of more than 800 million focused toward qualified small businesses in the nation's high tech arena. Through a competitive awards based program, he manages nearly 1000 contract efforts sponsored by over 50 Air Force organizations from across the nation. He also enables small businesses to explore their technological potential and provides the incentive to profit from commercializing their technology. Mr. David Shahedi is also an active colonel in the Air Force Reserve, having just recently served on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic in Michigan. It's my honor to introduce Mr. David Shahedi. Thank you, Anissa. Can everybody hear me? We can. Great. So first off, I just want to say uh, you know, thank you to Anissa for that wonderful introduction. Uh, what I'd really love to tell you is just how fantastic uh, it is to have Anissa uh, as a partner uh, in this overall effort. She is uh, a fantastic leader and, uh, and it is wonderful to have her 
uh, as the as one of the the forefront leaders and one of the drivers that have made these kinds of projects across the Air Force Research Laboratory possible. So you know, first off, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and and I wanted to make sure that that people knew that uh, that you may be the true brains behind our our enterprise. So I'm, I'm happy to be able to stand uh, with you in this. So thank first you. off, this program is a a, a fantastic. Uh, initiative across the board. It's a congressional program. It has so many different options. Uh, it is a it is a it is a terrific way to foster and grow small businesses uh, within our uh, within our nation. And there are a couple of things that I, I think is so important about this this quantum effort. Is, is this is a really a milestone activity? Uh, and, and someone asks you know me sometimes like, well, why do an STTR in this arena? And, and, and the reason is SDTR, the Small Business Technology Transfer Program, is, is really about taking academic uh, knowledge, academic expertise, and, and merging it with the innovation of small business. And in some instances, that's a, that is a, a tremendous proposition, that, that invention, ideas, uh, those things come out of our academic world. That, they're at the forefront of that. And our small businesses are really at the forefront of agility and business management and, and how to make things happen. So merging those two things together is certainly a humongous value proposition for, for all involved, not just the Air Force, but for small businesses and for academics as well. Uh, the second one is when uh, Congress stood up this program, they had a lot of different visions about what it would do, whether or not, hey, is there a way to get small businesses and, and academics to partner? Yes. But I think one of the bigger things that they really wanted to see was they wanted to see the bright minds that are in our academics and universities that are, you know, graduating or, or going into postgraduates that are leaving the universities and, and saying, hey, uh, you know what, you, you could not just instead of going and getting a new job, why don't you start your own business? Why don't you take the intellectual property that you've become an expert on and actually start your own business? And you can partner with the university in order to be able to have access to the university's uh, material, the, 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 the facilities, the, the, the infrastructure, and then you know, you're basically tied to the mothership. And then when you feel like you can go out on your own, you can go and do that. And so there's an entire spectrum of things that can be done within the STTR program. So the, the second piece of this was, you know, why the STTR program, and, and I think the, the best example is this is a truly wicked problem space. And being uh, the Air Force's uh, director in this regard, I, I get to work in things across the entire United States Air Force, everything from materials to advanced fighters, from you know, cyber uh, to, to space systems. And in every one of these domains, there are wicked problems. And these are the, the, the benchmark problems or the flagship problems of, of every one of these domains and enterprises. They are complex problems. They are not the kind that can be solved with simple things. They are not the kinds of problems that can be solved with simple math. And I, I think back to the times of Apollo and the Apollo astronauts. I am a, a third generation Air Force and my grandfather actually was a crew chief on the on the famous vomit comet flying the Apollo astronauts. And I think about the problems that they were dealing with, coming up with new math to do things. And, and Dr. Preskill actually, you know, he, I couldn't have been a better you know, earlier speaker because just listening to him, you realize just how complex this overall problem is. And, and the other part of this is, as you find a solution to something, you're actually creating other problems. And by solving something in one area, you may be sliding it to another. And it requires a concerted effort on every angle in order to address that problem. Uh, the other one about wicked problems like this is that the, you need a combined effort. You need multiple people from multiple domains and, and multiple angles to be able to go after and solve a problem. And so using the STTR program uh, was a natural progression of that, is to say, okay, well, academics have been working on this for quite a while. Uh, the, the Air Force's uh, leadership has been, you know, the Air Force's leadership in quantum has been working on this. Uh, there are obviously commercial companies out there that might be able to leverage this. How do we get all three of those partners overlapping at the same time? And then the last one is uh, these kinds of problems, they, they involve massive paradigm shifts, total new ways of doing things. 
and and they, they involve bringing in all new value propositions. The question of you know is there an application outside of the government for these things, and is there you know is it inside the government, is it outside the government? There's lots of different you know angles to that, and so that wicked problem space is another critical reason. The last thing that I just I wanted to to, to showcase with you is the uniqueness of this quantum opportunity. It is truly a merger of lots of different things at any one time. And traditionally, the Cyber program had a challenge uh, where we weren't as strategic as I wanted to see when I, when I first came on board. We weren't looking at big problems. There was lots of small things, but there wasn't a, a unification of multiple efforts to solve one of the big problems. Lots of success stories, but, but not enough success stories about massive efforts. And so this one uh, that was 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 brought about was a, a tremendous opportunity. And, and in, in the STTR world, probably the largest that I know of, the largest consolidated effort uh, that's been done uh, by any organization within the within the Air Force. The idea of this quantum, it's really having the right senior leadership at the with the right focus and the right commitment. The, the Air Force senior leadership, Dr. Roper. Uh, and the other uh, the other members of our senior leadership, they are completely committed to these long term problems and the idea of focusing the resources that we have on a very, very specific problem. And, and it's it's such a unique opportunity to have the right leader in the right place. Now, the other thing is this is a clear cut focus. You can see from the, the academic side, you can see from the, the, the operator side, you can see from the senior leadership side that Everybody understands that this is a complex problem and they all agree that they have to work together on that. And then the last is the right commitment. The commitment on the part of the senior leadership, Dr. Roper, and committing that, yes, the Air Force is going to carve off these resources and put it into this mission area. The, the commitment on the part of, of the, the program managers, the, the folks like uh, you know, Mr. Johns and, and, and Anissa Lumpkin and the, the contracts, the finance, the government side, that, hey, we're going to make this as streamlined as possible for you. And, and then the commitment on your part as, as small businesses and academics to, to come forward and, and be part of this enterprise. It is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. And, you know, the, the question is going to be out. Like every other effort, this is a pilot effort. It's an experiment. Can we take this kind of project that has been individual projects and, and can we have one consorted effort where not any one individual or any one company or any one academic is going to be able to solve it, but can we take enough folks together to unite to put together an overall problem? The best example I have of this is, uh, you know, here and talk, people talk about marathons. I'm actually a seven time Ironman athlete, but I have never ever been uh, what I would say truly competitive, not in my age group. I've never won a race. And then last year on Father's Day, uh, my children came to me and said, why don't we run uh, a triathlon as a relay? And so I'm a very experienced triathlete and I had two, you know, two of the children come forward and my, my daughter did the bike and I did the swim, my son did the run. And for the first time ever, we won our division. And I, 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 for the first time, I didn't just get a finisher medal, I got a, a winning medal. And what that says to me is that it's, it's very, very easy to get into the mindset of I can do everything myself. But to, but to unite with, with new players and to, with new individuals, that's really the, the, the focus of finding true success. And so the question is, will the quantum community, will the quantum program unite? And, and will you complete this task that's a, it's a daunting, wicked problem? And can you use the tools that we've been able to put and, and set up free for you? The, the, the idea of freeing up these resources to, to give the opportunities to those folks. Are we going to be able to do that? And when you cross the finish line at the, at the Ironman, what they announce as you come across the finish line is they say, you are an Ironman. And there is nothing more in my position that I would like to see and hear is that the quantum computing world crosses that finish line and, and hears that joyous statement, quantum computing, you are an Ironman. So you know, with that, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, it is such an honor to be working with, with all of you in this, this truly wicked problem space. And uh, if, if you've got any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, otherwise, thank you so much for letting me be here.
Thank you, Mr. Shahidi. That was a great story. And you're right, it's all about the teamwork. If you have some time for questions, we do have a number that have come in. Sure. All right, let's do it. What other technologies could benefit from collider-like events in the future? Well, so, you know, as, as Dr. Roper was mentioning earlier, uh, this is not just a, a one-time, you know, kind of proposition. We're looking to do this in, in many different genres. In fact, uh, there are ones that are doing, there's quantum, I'm sorry, there are collider events that are going on in material science. That's one of the other, you know, the areas that, that Anise is helping to head up. Uh, there are there are collider events like this that are going on in, in specific warfighter problems, like whether it's in training or whether it's in the space community. So I think that the answer to that question is, we are looking to use this tool this, this idea of the, the funding available by the SIBR and SIDR program combined with a more streamlined uh, approach to doing acquisition tied to a, a way of easily bringing a whole lot of companies and organizations together at any one time that we're planning to use these or we, we have been and we can, we're going to continue to use them across the entire spectrum of the Air Force's mission areas and across the entire spectrum of the Air Force's uh, science and technology or rdt &E problems. Great, right, thank you. We have another one. How do I get to participate in a future Cyber Sitter event? So the, the the interesting thing is that if if you think about this as a multiple you know multiple stage program, uh, you know the in, the intent is uh, we put out the solicitations now three times a year. The Air Force used to only do them one time a year, but we put out solicitations uh, three times a year that really basically say here's the open door, and here is a, a topic. Uh, that the Air Force is interested in. Uh, we do a number of things called open topics and they usually have focus areas or, or like I call them subtopics underneath those, those open topics on, on specifics. But every one of those open topics also says, is there something that, that you can do to get into that? And these are, these are small kind of phase one investments by the Air Force to say, yeah, we're gonna make an agreement to have a partnership. So that the idea of participating in some of these virtual collider events are really picking from that catalog of folks that we've brought in through our phase one program. And then the idea of, okay, of those you know, small bets that were made, who can we put medium sized bets on to go to the future? And then the, the, the future being, hey, the, the bigger part of the Air Force, the larger, as, as uh, Dr. Roper was talking about, the 600, you know, the, 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 the billion dollar programs and the $600 billion uh, portfolio. How, how do you get to those? Well, this is a series of steps. And, and where the Air Force used to have on the order of a thousand uh, phase ones every year in the last in the last fiscal year, we, we almost did 4000 or so projects. And so the, the idea of going to that number, um, there are lots of opportunities. Uh, so it is truly a partnership. So the, the, the way to get involved in in the collider events is one to listen to the problem space Two to actually put in a proposal into one of our uh, open solicitations. And then three, working with those folks that are your, your projects, uh, your project managers uh, to get on the get on the radar and be pulled into one of these large collider events. So those are, that's, that's the model that we've been really, really finding success in. Well, kind of to follow up on that, are you planning other events like this in the future? So there was a huge array of uh, there was a huge array of events that was scheduled last year, and like every like any uh, major, uh, I guess I'd call it paradigm shift, uh, we've actually run into a challenge uh, with you know the idea you know what was getting everybody together in one place and, and now starting to do things virtually. So I think now that the that I guess I call it the Air Force, the government, everybody is figuring out the idea of these virtuals virtual events. Yeah, there are a number of different events. And so if you're if you're looking for those or looking at to see, you know, any of those uh, what's what's going on or what's coming down the uh, you know, coming down the path or what's on the schedule, please come out to the, the Air Force's uh, uh, SBIR, SDRHR website or uh, search on our Air Force Ventures uh, endeavors and, and you'll see all the different events going on within the Air Force. Thanks, Tom. Okay, I got a, one more question for you. another one coming up. How is the Air Force Cyber Sitter simplifying the acquisition process? So a couple of things uh, that, that we've looked at. So one, let's talk about proposals. 
Um, you know, the idea of the CIVR program was to, you know, make the proposal writing and make the development of proposals kind of proportional to the size of the effort. And so instead of having these massive proposals, the Air Force skinnied those proposals down to, you know, a smaller proposal, 15 pages with a, with a PowerPoint slide deck. Now, the other part of that was um, to actually take uh, contracts and make them much more standardized. So instead of going on and and tying into uh, you know uh, multiple efforts, uh, you know the idea of saying can we go and do uh, you know kind of a more standard contract for for folks, uh, we've streamlined our financial uh, systems. And then probably the most significant is Cyber Program. Uh, you know, being a, a small business program. We relied on, on organizations all throughout the Air Force. Hundreds of organizations executed the program and, and hundreds of different contracts officers from across the Air Force would execute the program. Well, we started to consolidate that work so that they were all in one place. And what that does now is it makes sure that the folks that are executing those contracts are actually able to do that um, in a much more, uh, you know, a much more knowledgeable standpoint. So the idea of what was taking us you know, 180 days to get on contract for a phase one has gotten, you know, skinnied down to, to you know, you know, 30 days. What took us uh, six months sometimes to get on a phase two, we're getting down within 90 days. Unfortunately, COVID caused us the same problems that they caused everybody. Um, but I'm confident that as we started to figure out how these things were going to be done and how we were going to get access to government systems from outside the firewalls and using VPNs and all the things that have come about uh, that we'll get right back to that, 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 that pace of operation. So streamlining the acquisition process. And then the, 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 oh, the third one is making this portfolio of programs uh, a, available to the, uh, to the program offices, to the PEOs, to the organizations that are truly the buyers of the Air Force and saying, hey, here's this catalog of programs that have gone through this competitive market and, and they are now available for you okay, to make purchases on or to, to, to venture out with your prime contractors and to say, hey, here is a great set of vetted opportunities for, for prime contractors to bring on to some of our some of the larger efforts uh, or to, to advertise that to the commercial industry and say, look, this is things that the Air Force is interested in and maybe you on the commercial side is interested in well. So that, that entire you know, swath of things uh, is what helps to streamline acquisition. Great, thank you. We have about two minutes left and uh, got time for one more question, if you don't mind, sir. How are you planning on increasing the flow of information to let small businesses know how the Air Force is changing their approach to the cyber process? Well, like any effort, uh, you know, like any effort uh, that is in involved in a lot of different pilot experiments, lots of different ways of doing things, uh, you know, that's really what uh, the last fiscal year, what 2019 was. And so what, what the challenge coming from senior leadership is, you know, now taking the best of those breeds and consolidating them. And so going forward where there were, I guess, a number of different avenues and a number of different pilot programs and ways, everything from trying pitch days to trying, uh, you know, collider events. So we are in the process now of consolidating and that's what Dr. Roper is referring to in the uh, the idea of AF Ventures is this this umbrella across the entire Air Force that says, "Hey, this is going to be the entry point." And so, going forward, and you know, rolling out very soon, um, you know, the information on, on those, you, you are you know certainly pushed and welcome to go look at uh, the the Air Force uh, SBIR website uh, and soon to be a tied in of the Air Force Ventures and Air Force Cyber Program. Uh, to be able to find that's going to be your, your best source of information going forward uh, on how, how to, to best continue to, to interface with the Air Force uh, while still giving us the flexibility to, to try, try new things. But, but uh, you know, a lot of experiments are being consolidated right now, and we're taking all the lessons learned from all of those and building you know, one cohesive strategy. We know we didn't get it all right the first time on the experiments, uh, but we feel very confident going forward that we're going to build a very consolidated uh, approach to, to the Air Force's uh, Small Business Innovative Research Program. Well, thank you, Mr. Shahady. We appreciate your support and perspective in your time today. So next pleasure. up, we have Dr. Yvette Weber who will offer a warm introduction to our next speaker. Dr. Weber is a member of the Senior Executive Service 
and is Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Science, Technology, and Engineering, Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force. Dr. Weber is responsible for providing technical advice and counsel to the Air Force Acquisition Executive on a broad range of engineering and technical management areas. Thank you, Dr. Weber. The floor is yours. Well, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, much like my boss, Dr. Roper, I'm very excited to be a part of the Quantum Collider today and work toward partnering academia with industry and the Air Force to make progress on Q Day. Uh, continuing in a long line of excellent speakers, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Michael Hadick. Dr. Hadick is the Deputy Director of the Information Directorate at the Air Force Research Laboratory. He has dedicated his Air Force career to develop information technologies, and he has had a focus on emerging technologies in computing and communication. Dr. Hadick is involved in many levels with quantum information. He is involved with the National Quantum Initiative, which is chartered at connecting stakeholders and enabling access to state-of-the-art R&D infrastructure. He supports the National Science and Technology Council Subcommittee on Quantum Information Science. He is also the Air Force representative to the Quantum Economic Development Consortium. He's also spearheading the Open Innovation Campus, an initiative to develop an ecosystem at Griffiths Technical Park in Rome, New York, that connects global technology leaders with tough computational problems. And if that's not enough, he has published over 50 papers and holds a patent in photonics technology. It's my pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Michael Hadick, a key player in the development of quantum strategy at both the Air Force and the national level. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weber, for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's truly an honor to be here today and to be a part of this great event. Uh, it's, it's been a long time coming and I really want to thank the team for being able to uh, pull it all together and to really do that transition where we went from a virtual, uh, we turned it into a virtual event after planning, as Colonel Lawrence said, to be live in uh, Brooklyn uh, way back, uh, you know, once we, March came, we need, needed to, to transition this and, and the team was able to do it and uh, to keep the dates the same. So we're very thankful for that. So I will begin with my first slide, if they could come up. I do not see them right now. There we go. So to begin, let me talk a little bit about Air Force Research Laboratory for folks in the audience. I know we have a great turnout today. So, so let me give folks kind of a, a level set here in terms of what we are at AFRL. So Air Force Research Laboratory is the primary scientific and technology research and development center for the Air Force. Uh, we were stood up in 1997 uh, through the merger of four super labs, uh, including Air Force Office of Scientific Research. We're headquartered at Roy Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, and our current workforce is about 11,000 employees, including military, government, uh, and contract positions. Uh, in terms of budget, you heard Mr. Blackhurst talk about that before. Uh, on the order of about $6 billion or so, spread across many different categories. Uh, AFRL has nine technology directorates, and we're going to talk a bit about that today as we talk about the quantum information science program across AFRL. Uh, but AFRL is also located in nine different geographic regions uh, throughout the U.S., as well as having international sites in uh, three countries. We're going to hit upon that as well. Uh, and we continue to build upon, especially as we go to a new frontier here with, with quantum, but building upon 100 years of critical R&D efforts for the Air Force and the Department of Defense. Next slide, please. In 2018, uh, we were challenged uh, to go and to take an enterprise look at quantum information science in terms of what the different pieces of AFRL were doing. Uh, we came up with a strategy. It's been uh, uh, iterated on. We've worked it. We've reworked it. And I'm pretty comfortable with where we're at. So we have four main technology areas that go on the outside of this puzzle piece, if you will. Uh, Beginning in the top left corner, uh, we have timing, we have sensing, we have computing, and we have communications and networking. And we're going to really focus in on those four areas as we go throughout this talk. 
But all of this, all of this great technology would not be possible if it were not for uh, the pieces in the middle, and that being the supply chain and the enabling technology, as well as workforce development. We're going to talk more about those pieces as well as we go on today. But as you think about this collider event, it's really the confluence and bringing together all these, not only the tech areas, but that supply chain and how we can make this enduring and to last beyond, you know, the near term and how, really how to develop this into a long term endeavor. And the other thing here is, is we talked about and as we go through this talk, keep in mind, this is not just what AFRL is doing, but really being part of a, of a larger effort, this whole of nation approach that we need to take. And as part of the National Quantum Initiative, as well as you know, one of the subsets of that being the Quantum Economic Development Consortium that Dr. Bros is going to speak about shortly, we see ourselves you know, as really being a key driver in that, but we can't go at it alone. We need others. We need partners from other government agencies all the way down to small businesses. Next slide, please. Mr. Blackhurst gave a great introduction in terms of quantum information science across AF4L. Uh, in fact, you'll see here with the uh, two letter acronyms, six of the nine technical directorates of AF4L actually have programs within quantum. Uh, I'm not gonna go through these in detail. We're actually gonna speak to these uh, as we go into the four different areas as well as the two enabling areas, but you can see them uh, uh, listed there. And what I'd like to point out when we break these down into the tech areas, these are multiple directorates working these areas, and we have some great partnerships formed between the different pieces and the different directorates. So for example, uh, quantum communications and networking work is done by both the directed energy directorate as well as the information directorate. Space vehicles works on quantum sensing, quantum clocks, uh, really the heart of position, navigation, and timing work they're doing with the sensors directorate. Uh, information director where I'm located in here in Rome, New York. We do quantum computing, really the algorithm development for that, as well as I mentioned the communications and networking. And then finally, a lot of our device work and our supporting foundational technology in uh, uh, materials and manufacturing, RX, as well as the sensors director, ROI. And finally, all this work would not be possible without the great uh, basic foundational work being done by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research uh, located in Arlington, Virginia. I'd also like to point out, this is very important as we go through the talk, that uh, you know, there's great quantum going on throughout the world. And the fact that we have three international sites really allows us to tap into that. Those sites being in London, Tokyo, and Santiago, Chile. Next slide, please. This gets to the heart of where we're going at AFRL in our technologies. I don't want to spend too much time on this and really get bogged down into it because I'm going to break out all of these uh, different areas, these four areas. But for quantum timing, quantum sensing, communications networking, and computing, you see those areas that uh, we'll be talking about later on. But it really gets to, you know, how do you put timing and sensing together to, to get at self-sustained PNT, where you may be in a PNT or a GPS denied or degraded environment? How can you bring quantum technologies to the fight? And similarly, once you put the harness the powers of the future powers of quantum computing and quantum networking together, how can you get at things like distributed computing? and uh, uh, quantum networks that link together clocks and uh, being able to uh, link different parts of the world together uh, to, to really get at you know, what quantum technology will be able to bring to the fight. And of course, on the far right, workforce and enabling technologies allow us to attain that. Next slide, please. On this slide, this is where we see the Air Force going. We call this our OV1, our operational view. And you'll see the no surprise right now, timing, sensing, uh, communications and computing. And these are put together in a certain order. So if we start top left and go clockwise, these are really in terms of maturity. So we see timing and sensing as being uh, more mature, being able to be fieldable, being able to make an impact sooner than some of the further out technologies such as communications and computing. But you see these all do really play together. So we've talked about uh, PNT, and the need to have uh, in GPS denied environments, be able to have you know PNT resilient systems. Uh, so things like long duration unaided inertial navigation brings together quantum sensing as well as quantum clocks. Quantum sensors also allow us in the future to have uh, standoff uh, detection capabilities such as bunker and tunnel detection using uh, quantum sensors. Uh, how you bring these things together is really the quantum network. And I think we're just really scratching the surface of what quantum networking, uh, networking is going to be able to do for us. But we do know and we do see it as, as low probability of intercept communications, uh, things like secure encryption. 
and bringing together uh, entanglement distribution for things we probably haven't even thought about yet, but the fact that we can bring together clocks and have time transfer between different platforms that then allows us to, to fuse together you know, apertures of much higher resolution, giving us those sensing capabilities that we don't have right now. And then finally, computing. What does computing bring to the play? We're gonna to talk to that later on. Uh, you know, we're just trying to figure out right now where quantum computers are, are, are really gonna be able to make an impact, especially for the Air Force. But we certainly see things like, you know, being able to process uh, large amounts of data, asset optimization, enhancing machine learning, uh, and, and of course, what Dr. Prescott talked about, quantum simulation, quantum chemistry, being able to get at the heart of what nature has given us and be able to use quantum computers to simulate that and, and determine how systems actually operate. So bringing all those pieces together is really the heart of our quantum strategy. Now let's take a few minutes to, to dig deeper into some of these technologies. Next slide, please. We'll begin with timing. And, and again, here, this is talking about GPS precision and GPS denied environments. In the, in the next several slides, we're going to talk current, midterm, and future. And everyone's going to ask, well, why don't you have time frames laid upon these? Well, they're different for all these technologies. And in fact, some of these are accelerating. What we've seen since our strategy was formulated two years ago, technologies are moving faster. And a lot of it is driven by industry commitment, government commitment to the funding levels and able to push the technologies further along. So let's take, for example, let's start with clocks. So when we think of clocks, uh, everyone's obviously familiar with clocks and you think of uh, GPS and, and the fact that it needs clocks. Well, the, the history of clocks and certainly for these types of applications, one of being the first applications of quantum technology dating back actually to the 1970s, uh, clocks we can really characterize by stability. So having 10 to the minus nine or nanosecond per day under static condition stability, uh, being pretty small, we've been able to shrink these down. Uh, things like the, the CSAC program listed below, uh, government efforts, DARPA type efforts that have really shrunk these capabilities down into something very small. But we're still at the fact where we need GPS updates several times per day to make systems practical. Now, as we move towards more midterm, going to the, the middle screen right now, is that if we want to improve stability going from you know, past 10 to the minus nine, Next is up picoseconds. So if we want to look to something like that, we're going to have larger tables full of equipment right now. So we're on the order of about 500 liters uh, is a near, you know, is a midterm type uh, of benchmark that we need to get to. But we also want to get to fewer timing updates, clocks that can hold time for weeks to a month. And you can see how this in, in the future, that this would be key on a, a long uh, duration type mission. And of course, you know, we, we understand that, that there's a trade off here, right? You increase the stability, your volume is going to go up. So as we move towards the future, you know, how can we then get to, uh, you know, new capabilities? How can we shrink the components down? And you can see where a lot of the work that we're going to be talking about, you know, in these uh, collider events are driving towards this. So not only being able to have new components, have improved components, but also new architectures, uh, being able to bring in things, you know, like ion traps, uh, cold atom technologies to, to develop new types of clocks. And then how do we move towards larger systems, entangled type clock networks? Next slide. Let's now turn our attention to sensors. So again, this ties together really well with the clock work, but here we're talking about inertial navigation type systems. And you know, for right now, volume on the order of 100 to 1,000 liters uh, with GPS accuracy for only about an hour or so at best. Right, so we have to do better on that. Now, if we go midterm, you know, of course we want to reduce the noise and, and drive down the volume, but it's really the GPS-like accuracy when you lose that signal, when you're in the fight, when you can't get that signal locked on to, that we need to have durations for much longer and to know exactly where we're at. The bottom bullet in the mid slide I'm going to talk to you about next, but this is an amazing uh, challenge problem that we're working on with our what are called our five eye country. So we're going to hold off on that for a second. But of course, as we go towards the future, you know, we need to drive towards multiple hours for long duration missions, but still have knowing exactly where we are in terms of precise time as well as position. So that's where the Air Force really needs to get to. And we truly believe that as quantum technologies continue to develop, uh, we will be able to, uh, to, to hit these benchmarks and hit these, these milestones. On the next slide, 
I'm going to talk briefly about a PNT strategic challenge. And we launched this uh, again two years ago in 2018, August 2018. And this is bringing together what we call our five highest countries, so the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, and bringing quantum technologies out to the field. And this is a very hard problem, but the FRL commander uh, challenged us. The uh, chief of naval research challenged the Navy to, to how can we get technology out there? We know it's not going to be perfect. Dr. Roper talked about it, he eloquently talked about that, but we need to take a shot. We need to show that, you know, things that are on four by eight optical tables today, how can they operate in the field and what types of research and development do we need to feed those technologies to make them realizable and practical to make this an iterative loop? So in 2022 at the RIMPAC, uh, challenge, which is a large exercise out in the Pacific Ocean. We're going to bring uh, with our partners on a ship uh, hosted by New Zealand uh, GPS challenged environments, and we're going to show that we can take you know these PNT technologies using uh, things like uh, gravity, gravity, gradiometers, magnetometers, clocks, gyroscopes, put them all together, merge the technology, use sensor fusion technologies that the sensors director is working on, and, and really being able to lock on to things. Like I said, we know it's not gonna be perfect. There's gonna be a lot of learning going on, to be quite honest. But as we get better, and as we go out to 2024 in the next exercise, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be pushing the limits here, and it's really exciting for us, so stay tuned for that. Next slide, please. Now let's turn our attention to communications and networking. And we broke out communications into two main areas, really to cover the whole, whole layers of the communication uh, type system. So in this first slide here, we're gonna talk about satellite-based quantum networks and really work that is being done at the Directed Energy Directorate by Dr. Grunheisen. Uh, one of the things you'll notice here is that we're really pushing on quantum entanglement and how we can get the advantages of quantum entanglement and to have them play into quantum networking. Uh, one of the things that we're very strategic about is that QKD or quantum key distribution is something that the Air Force, you know, sees as an early prototype and a, and a kind of a nice stepping stone, but not really something that's going to pay off long term benefits for us. And that is, you know, our position going forward there. But we see, you know, we can put our resources into many other things. Uh, we talked about the prototyping and field testing components. Dr. Grunheisen has published some great papers right now, uh, in fact, on how to have 24-7 uh, operation. Uh, which one of the traditional problems is that uh, given that we're generally on the order of single photons, you know, when you bring sunlight into play, how does that saturate detectors? Well, Dr. Grunheisen has come up with some amazing uh, spatial and spectral filtering technologies to, to get away from that. And in, in the midterm, you know, where can we go to test out some of these technologies? So we're partnering uh, with some of our uh, uh, allies, some of our international partners here to look at, you know, rides that we can get and actually test our technologies, ground-based technologies up to a satellite, uh, and really make for a tight partnership. So much more to come on that. But then as we go towards the future, so you know, how do we use entanglement distribution? How can we have this entangled network? So when we talk about uh, other technologies, other pieces of the network, having satellites is critical, being able to link you know, air and ground platforms together and really go after that global type network. Next slide, please. So here, this is work that I want to focus in on that's really being done here at the uh, information director, but it ties in extremely well with the directed energy work uh, that Mark Grunheisen is doing. So uh, heads off to our team in terms of really uh, taking a, an approach here where Dr. Roper talked about ion traps in the ytterbium traps and being able to trap an ion in our labs here and something that he was excited to do uh, you know, several months ago. Uh, so we have uh, been doing ytterbium ions. We're now moving to barium ion traps uh, where we see you know, advantages with that. But we're also bringing other things into there, such as uh, integrated photonics and, and teaming up with AIM Photonics, which is one of the um, National Network of Manufacturing Institutes run by the DOD and really pushing uh, integrated photonics, be able to take four by eight optical tables, being able to shrink them down on the chips to make them practical, to make them fieldable. Uh, and then also now we're, we're getting into superconducting qubits. And we see this as really being, you know, the fact that we can bring different technologies together, hybrid type uh, demonstrations, and really the best of the best qualities across all of them. As we move out, going to the mid panel here, the midterm demonstrations, 
this three node network. So as we move from the lab, we see ourselves going to one of our off sites here uh, at our Stockbridge site, how we can interface the photonics and the UAV, uh, tying that together with ion traps on the ground, as well as semiconductor, superconductors on the ground and, and having uh, uh, entanglement distribution that way. And then as we move towards the future, you know, moving towards what makes a network, going to nodes greater than five. Uh, and really kind of some of the holy grails of networking really being um, quantum memory and quantum repeater development. So again, going back to those technologies where we need continued R&D and not just laying the infrastructure in place, but really hitting upon the, the hard and technically challenging problems there as well. And ultimately integrating all these things together, uh, not only at the ground level, uh, in the air level, but bringing in the space piece as well. Next slide. So in our fourth piece of technology, it's our computing piece. And here I'm really talking about algorithm development for Air Force needs. Uh, we've heard a lot about computing development, hardware development. We read about, about that in the press, the supremacy experiments. But here uh, we have a strategic decision in AFRL to really concentrate on algorithm development and software development and getting at what quantum computers can do for the Air Force. Uh, so on the right side, on the left side, currently, uh, one of the things to really highlight is that last year in 2019, uh, AFRL became a partner with IBM on its quantum network, uh, quantum network, and we became a hub member. And what this allows us to do is to have access to prototype quantum computers at IBM, the NIST type machines that tech, uh, Professor Pressfield talked about earlier. So I don't need to go into great detail on those, but really the, the low number of qubits and really get our hands wet, uh, our hands dirty, uh, feet wet with uh, just going out and seeing what we could do with quantum computers. Uh, and there's a lot of platforms out there. So being able to program on specific computers right now gives us certainly an advantage. But the big part about being on the Q network is bringing in partners. And you're gonna hear this theme in the last few minutes of my talk about partnerships and doing things differently and, and bringing in others. You know, I talked about that whole of nation approach, but this now really forms you know, some of our tech partners, not only leading universities, but other parts of the DOD. For example, uh, we have a strong partnership with the Naval Research Laboratory on the Q network. We're bringing in the Naval Postgraduate School as well, uh, soon to be Sandia, uh, places, uh, other universities, uh, including SUNY, are all gonna be part of this uh, system for us. Now, as we move towards the midterm, what we see here is, you know, what are the applications uh, that are going to come into play? And starting out certainly scheduling problems, quantum annealing problems, testing of neural networks, those are all things that, you know, we're working on right now. Uh, but it's really about developing that test bed, developing the workforce, developing the critical mass to get moving in those areas. And finally, as we go forward, you know, we're not sure where the quantum computing hardware of choice is gonna end up. So we're, we're certainly being the government, we're being the Air Force, we have the privilege of being able to look across many different platforms out there, many different types of technologies. You see some of the vendors listed in the upper right corner. And what we really wanna do is we see, you know, near term or, or applications or immediate type, you know, where we see quantum computing playing into play are things like, you know, optimization, resource allocation, asset allocation, as you might imagine, is very important for the Air Force material discovery, being able to simulate what uh, nature gives to us. And finally, how do we enhance and accelerate machine learning? And we'll see this as I talk about later on is um, in our open innovation campus. Next slide. So in our enabling technologies here, it's really bringing together a lot of those pieces, that continued R&D piece. You see the gravity, gravity radiometer, the magnetometers, but really being able to develop integrated systems where we bring down what we call in the DOD swap or size, weight, and power of these enabling technologies. And moving from bulky systems that may operate at cryogenic temperatures or, or require really price, precise control to in more integrated room temperature type devices, uh, things like integrated photonics, things like new and novel qubits like um, uh, diamond uh, vacancies uh, or uh, nitrogen vacancies in diamond and how we are able to, to leverage what is out there and what we can further develop. But finally, workforce development. We heard Dr. Roper talk very much about this. And we see the intersection of engineering, computer science, and physics as quantum information science goes forward. It's not just going to be the PhD in the lab toiling over a four by eight optical table 
or over his dilution refrigerator. You know, we need to bring in other disciplines, other technologies, especially as we look at quantum computing and bring quantum computing out to the masses. So things like the Open Innovation Campus, which I'll be talking about soon. So next slide. I know I'm running a little short on time here. So here is just a look at how we can start bringing some of these technologies. And I won't spend much time on this, but uh, talking about, you know, the open environment, then our in-house laboratories and finding our field sites. Next slide. The Open Innovation Campus is, I want to spend a few minutes on this, is really doing things differently in the Air Force. We talked about, Dr. Dr. Roper did an amazing job talking about how we need to do things differently in the Air Force and, and really going out and reaching the best talent in the world. And we feel that the OIC or the Open Innovation Campus is going to allow us to do that. This is a unique partnership uh, that is just standing up right now. It'll actually be opening within the next month or two. Uh, it's renovated space uh, just outside our facilities, just outside our gate here in Rome, New York. 40,000 square feet facility, three floors uh, that New York State, uh, Oneida County, the county we sit in, have put in $12 million to renovate this 40,000 square foot facility. Uh, we have amazing partners in addition to those listed, the city of Rome, our partner intermediate uh, agreements that we have with uh, Griffiths Institute, as well as NICE Tech and the Central New York Defense Alliance. Uh, have all brought this together and SUNY uh, being State University of New York being another driver for us in this campus. Next slide. Here uh, really tells us what we're going to do about uh, in the center and the OIC. Uh, we've embarked on setting this up. The reason we did this was to really get at you know doing things differently and the fact that we couldn't easily work with a lot of non-traditional partners. Hence the collider event here. You'll be able to work with small businesses, you know, small setups, and also international partners that couldn't easily come on to Air Force property uh, to work with, even though they're doing very foundational technologies. Uh, so we saw the OIC or this open campus type environment as, as a way to bring these together. And, and it's really all about the technology and talent acceleration that we hope to achieve by this. And it's also all about the partnerships uh, that I talked about on the last page, but also bringing together industry, academia, small business, all feeding uh, our technologies uh, together and really getting after the heart problems. Uh, we see this as a catalyst, bringing together world-class researchers uh, combined with state-of-the-art facilities. Uh, in that facility are gonna be new quantum laboratories, new neuromorphic computing laboratories. There's also prototyping labs to, to bring together the information technologies that the information director is working on, but really to go after very focused challenge problems, hard Air Force problems that you know we can get to, but it's really you know, our partners that are gonna help us get there. And it's this new business model, because it's not just a facility, it's really about this whole new business model. So uh, Dr. Roper talked about being in this for the long term, and we absolutely agree with that strategy piece. Being able to go out, uh, develop a strategy, we know that we're gonna be successful and have the center booming when it first starts off where are we going to be at five years from now? So we've carefully laid out a strategy uh, in partnership with uh, the Research Foundation of, of State University of New York and looking at how we can build upon this and really drive the technology ecosystem, not only for the Air Force, but for our local uh, partners as well and local community. Last slide, next slide. Uh, just drives again to the, to the partnerships here. Uh, the only thing I want to add here are some events coming up. One is there is a video that's on the um, Quantum Collider website. Uh, click on the link, we're able to show it today. But uh, take a look at it. This will really start getting excited, get at what we're gonna be doing in the OIC. I can tell you the new branding will be coming out. So the OIC is not a name that's gonna stick, but I think you're all gonna be pretty excited about what the name is. And then last but not least, we had this great Collider event today and tomorrow, but we're not gonna stop there. What we're going to be doing this summer, and we'll be having a formal announcement on this within the next week or so, a partnership between Air Force Office of Scientific Research and the Information Directorate, as well as a sprinkling of other partners and funding opportunities to, to roll out this $1 million challenge, where we're going to be providing small grants uh, for primarily universities, but if universities partner with small businesses, you know, how they can go out and, and develop new technologies and, again, accelerate quantum technologies uh, and push push the limits out there. So we're going to be having a, a challenge competition. Uh, it, we'll have the call out there, and we'll similar to this. We'll have um, uh, teams challenging in the four areas of quantum. Uh, 
sometime in August. So uh, stay tuned for that. It will be, I could say, 18 to 20 August. Stay tuned for that. I think it's exciting times. Uh, so hopefully in the last 20 minutes or so, I've, I've rolled out the AFRL strategy, talked about quantum, the different areas, as well as you know where we're headed to uh, in terms of partnerships and tech and talent acceleration. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Haydick. We appreciate it. Unfortunately, we do not have time for questions, but thank you for that perspective on the Air Force strategy, particularly as it relates to quantum. Okay, next up, we'll take another quick break. Please be back in about 10 minutes with another great lineup of speakers, including Dr. Joseph Bros from the Quantum Economic Development Consortium, who will dis discuss the quantum industry progress and outlook. We'll also have Mr. Evan DeGenero from NYSTEC and Mr. Daniel Madden from Ensign, who will offer a look inside New York State resources. Finally, Colonel Timothy Lawrence will offer closing remarks and give you a sneak peek at what's coming up next in the world of quantum at AFRL. As with the last break, be on the lookout for a few poll questions, and we'll see you back soon. And thank you for sticking around as we enter the final portion of today's program. Next, we have Mr. Sridhar Srinivasan and Ms. Cheryl Samuel, both from the Air Force's Office of Commercial and Economic Analysis. Mr. Srinivasan is the Digital Technologies Portfolio Manager, and Ms. Samuel is a Business and Financial Intelligence Analyst. Both of them have had the pleasure of working with Dr. Rose and the QEDC on all things quantum over the past six months. Thank you both for joining us today. Good afternoon. Uh, as uh... As, as was mentioned, my name is Sridhar Srinivasan. My colleague Cheryl Samuel and I are with the U.S. Air Force's Office of Commercial and Economic Analysis. Uh, next slide, please. OSEA is a relatively new office. Our mission is to preserve U.S. Air Force and DOT military advantage from commercial and economic risks. So our primary focus in looking at quantum is on the commercial space. Next slide, please. OSEA is organized around portfolios. We have a strategic initiatives portfolio that does in-depth analytic assessments to identify and assess geostrategic risks that could affect U.S. Air Force advantage. Um, they do primarily policy-related work relating to great power competition, macro factors, and the like. We also have technology portfolios that include space, manufacturing technologies, maritime, aviation, assured mobility, and digital technologies, which Cheryl and I are a part. The digital technologies portfolio focuses on semiconductors and microelectronics, 5G, sensors and IoT, artificial intelligence, autonomy, of course, QIS, and digital reality. Next slide, please. Um, the OSEA's, for, uh, OSEA's work is done primarily using open source research. We start by taking a look at a given industry, say quantum, and identify key terms associated with that industry, things like entanglement, cryocoolers, ion traps, and the like. We then use those terms to do searches, and these open source searches allow us to develop a picture of what's going on in the industry as a whole. We also then develop a taxonomy of terms, which is basically a soup to nuts description of the terms used uh, within, and, uh, within and amongst the industry as a whole. Once we have the taxonomy, we develop what's called a value chain, which is also a soup to nuts listing of how the end effects in a given industry are provided. So for example, one would start with single photon detectors or a cryo cooler at the top of the value chain and end at the quantum magnetometer at the bottom of the value chain, tracking each step in between. Once we have the value chain, we populate each node or step on the value chain with companies that play in that space. That allows us to understand the ecosystem of companies serving that industry. Once we have the ecosystem, we can do things like do emerging trends analyses, uh, looking at commercial and economic trends that may affect adoption or may affect how the technology is developing. We can also do things like look at the white space, which is where the US government and private industry is not in investing and perhaps should. With that, I hand off to, uh, to Cheryl Samuel, who will tell you a little bit more about uh, the QEDC and about Dr. Joe Bros. Well, thanks, Katie, and welcome, everybody. The QEDC, or the Quantum Economic Development Consortium, was born out of the National 
uh, Quantum Initiative Act of 2018, along with support from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. The QEDC focuses not only on the on qubits, but on the entire ecosystem, um, all quantum enabling technologies. Their mission is to enable and grow a robust commercial quantum based industry and associated supply chain within the US, which will then subsequently yield a stronger US national security posture, both commercially as well as on the offense. Through collaborative efforts, information sharing and standards development, members from industry, academia, government, defense, as well as others uh, develop use cases and identify gaps in technologies as well as assess the potential economic impact of quantum technologies. Small businesses and startups represent more than half of the QEDC membership, as well as multi-million dollar corporations. The QEDC is very bimodal. In terms of small businesses, the QEDC offers insight into DOD-centric dual-use applications and how these small businesses and startups may apply their work not only to the commercial sector, but also to defense and government as well by engaging a much larger constituent base, encouraging and fostering their participation. The QEDC overall expands upon opportunities within DOD in quantum technologies, in addition to the Department of Energy, as well as the National Science Foundation, uh, opening doors that would not normally be as reachable or as achievable. And now I'm happy to introduce Dr. Joe Bros. He is the executive director of the QEDC, which is comprised of over 150 US corporations, universities, national laboratories, and NGOs in the emerging quantum industry. Joe is also a senior advisor in quantum with the AFRL and has over 35 years of experience in the industry as well as the public sector. He's also considered a subject matter expert in condensed matter physics, quantum systems, and nuclear magnetic resonance. Joe received his PhD in physics from the ETH Zurich and his undergrad degree in physics from MIT. And lastly, to add a bit of a personal note, I wanted to offer my gratitude to Joe as well as the QDC Deputy Director Celia Merzbacher. They have uh, been very supportive of the quantum sub portfolio and the digital technologies team here at OSEA and have been instrumental in building our strong collaborative partnership and information sharing regarding companies and their respective work for the development of the OSEA building blocks which three mentioned include the ecosystem, the taxonomy, the value chain, as well as the identification of emerging trends in quantum information science. The QEDC has introduced the OSEA team to a, to a number of QEDC members who in turn have made themselves available for questions and answers to help more effectively and efficiently conduct our research, moving toward the path of proactively identifying economic risks to the US Air Force, the DOD, and the US government as a whole. Uh, with that, please welcome Dr. Joe Bros of the QEDC. Well, thank you, Cheryl, for your kind introduction and your kind words. Uh, and uh, I've enjoyed very much the collaboration with OCEA and with you and Sri over this last period of time. And I look forward to that ongoing collaboration that has been so productive. I'm pleased to have the opportunity today to speak to you about the QEDC and on behalf of our steering committee governing board, uh, my uh, deputy director, Celia Mertzbacher and myself, we uh, really look forward to engaging more and more uh, companies within the QEDC in the uh, uh, near future. And we also value our collaboration with AFRL greatly. Uh, Dr. Haydick, who spoke so well about the various activities within AFRL regarding quantum information science uh, has been a uh, consistent participant with us in our steering committee activities and technical activities, as well as Colonel Lawrence uh, and uh, Mr. Blackhurst uh, really value all of the collaborations. And I know that all of our members benefit from it. May I have the next slide? Thank you. I'd like to just give you a quick overview of the QEDC, what it is, how it was established, and where it's going. Um, and hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a snapshot of the progress we've made and where we're headed. Um, first, the QEDC was born out of the National Quantum Information Strategy. There are six basic policy principles that underpin that strategy. And 
the establishment of a consortium speaks to the third bullet here, which is deepening the engagement with industry. And that is a, a key element to continue to exponentiate U.S. leadership in the quantum sciences, as Dr. Roper referred earlier in his keynote address today. Next slide, please. The National Quantum Initiative in Section 201 of its uh, law established a quantum consortium with industry with the listed goals to take a look at research needs and enabling technology gaps, and then to provide recommendations on how to close those gaps. So the QEDC as a consortium was seeded with money from NIST. We also uh, uh, graciously uh, uh, received uh, money from AFRL, and uh, we're very thankful for all of the supporters in industry and uh, government that have gotten us started in this last 18 months to two years. Next slide, please. The purpose of the QEDC is to really identify economically important applications and use cases. And then with those, those are really those applications that are going to drive the quantum industry forward. And I think Dr. Preskill uh, gave a very good outline of those extremely important po uh, leverage points with the quantum information industry. Secondly, we're focused on enabling technologies. What we want to do is really understand what are those fundamental technologies that all quantum science is needing and might be impeding innovation today. So we look across all the areas of quantum science, sensing, communications, computation, simulation. And what we want to do is look at what enabling technologies are common or most common to the majority of those. And how can we now uh, make those tools and enabling technologies more available to the researcher and to the industry that's commercializing these technologies. We also involve ourselves in standards and benchmark recommendations. While we're not an SDO or a standards development organization, we do make recommendations for standards where we see that they should be made. And we're also very involved in developing the quantum workforce, and I'll have a bit more to discuss about that later. The one thing about the consortium is it is a one-stop shop for industry. We try to speak with a collective industry voice to government as well as back to the industry itself and globally so that we can guide research and development to those opportunities that will help exponentiate quantum information science and its commercialization. Next slide. We have today 150 members. They're broken out as indicated on the left-hand side with about 113 corporations, 26 academic institutions, and 12 national labs and NGOs. Um, the group of companies, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, a list of their names, um, really divide naturally into six uh, ecosystems starting with hardware developers. Those are people that are really developing the quantum hardware, the qubit systems, the computers, the NISCs, the sensor systems, and the communication networks. Then in that stack are the software developers. Those are the uh, entities that are really engaged in developing algorithms and translating that to quantum software. We have suppliers. These are individuals that are supplying needed enabling technology equipment to the quantum industry, such as lasers, microwave pulse generators, and uh, cryostatic systems. These are things that are needed across the board in much of quantum science. We have end users, companies on our list, such as Wells Fargo, Citibank, and the Federal Reserve Bank, who are really aware that quantum information science is going to change the dynamics of their business. And they want to be ahead of it 
so that they can anticipate that change and capitalize on it. We do have standards developers within our organization, many NGOs, and we also have researchers and academics. And again, we represent the entire cross-section of quantum information sciences from computation, simulation, to comms, metrology, and sensing. Next slide, please. This is a list of signatories uh, as of early May. Um, as you look through this list, you'll see companies that um, represent each of those six constituents that I discussed earlier. You'll see suppliers, you'll see quantum hardware developers, you'll see software companies um, on here, and then you'll see professional societies and academic institutions. It's interesting to look at this list and not only divide it by the type of company and their activity and role and stakeholdership within the quantum ecosystem, but also it's worth noting that there are both large and small businesses on the list, as Cheryl pointed out in her remarks. In fact, 35% of the companies on this list are large companies with more than 5,000 employees. And there are 60% that are quite small and have 500 or fewer employees. Only 5% are in the middle between the 500 and 5,000 employee uh, mark. They also represent the fusion of very important cultures here in the United States of science, of what we call road mapping culture, and the culture of agile, where things are innovated very quickly failing forward very fast. Next slide, please. We are run by a steering committee and the individuals listed on the left are on our steering committee. And we're very grateful for the extraordinary amount of time that they have committed to the QEDC and its success. The um, uh, composition of the board are three large industry members represented by Boeing, Google, and IBM. We have three uh, small and mid cap companies represented, and then two federal partners with Carl Williams from NIST, who's really the uh, 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 one of the grandfathers, if you will, of the QEDC. And it was through his uh, efforts and those of others at OSTP like Jake Taylor and many in industry like Chris Monroe and the individuals at OSA that had the vision for the QEDC, put it together and help form the National Quantum Initiative Act. We also have a representative, uh, Carol Hawk from the Department of Energy, who has now replaced Bill Vanderland uh, just uh, in the last couple of weeks. And Bill is now over at uh, the Pentagon and we appreciate all the effort that he has provided. Next slide, please. We have four technical advisory committees within the QEDC, and they're listed here. They are enabling technologies, quantum use cases, workforce, and standards. Each of these tacks forms what I call the heartbeat or the four-chambered heart of the QEDC. And we're very grateful to these leaders as well who come from industry and academia in order to lead the technical advisory committees. Through these, we hold workshops, we hold uh, uh, many different seminars, uh, webinars online, as well as producing reports that uh, we generate in terms of making uh, research and development recommendations. Very soon, we'll be receiving money from the government through the QEDC based upon its recommendations in order to fund research and development work in the enabling technology and supply chain. Next slide, please. So uh, I would like to just quickly review the QEDC, its progress and accomplishments. We've formed first a very diverse and active consortium of stakeholders here in the United States. Um, we will, in the not distant future, be broadening out to international stakeholders and those discussions 
are already very well underway. Our main purpose is to identify enabling technology areas of needs. Okay, and what what I uh, uh, like to to say to that is that the QEDC is not about qubits. What we are is about the, all of those technologies that allow qubits to exist, to be stable and controllable, and through that we're able to have the largest impact on the innovation cycle in quantum technology. Now, we certainly don't ignore qubits, and in our use case tack, that's indeed what we study are those use cases which are driving commercialization in the United States. We hold technical workshops to identify these needs, and then we uh, produce a set of research and development recommendations, which are being used by the United States government in order to uh, better focus research and development needs. We also create roadmaps for those research directions. We uh, have looked at quantum information science workforce characteristics and key trends and have performed a uh, survey among our members and are getting ready to launch a second survey uh, in uh, another uh, month or two where we will survey all 150 members, which represents the uh, vast majority of the quantum industry in the United States, to really better understand the workforce, where are the trends, how many people are engaged, and what specialties they need, and more importantly, what are the gaps that uh, should be closed in order to make sure that we have that adequate workforce in the future. This also applies to AFRL, which has a uh, ongoing need for expertise and talent within the Air Force. And uh, we hope to continue to help them attract individuals, both companies and individual researchers to AFRL to fulfill Air Force needs in research and development. We've uh, been very involved in standards and benchmarks, and um, uh, we have conducted an assessment of the quantum computing market. And uh, as I mentioned, our interest is in informing government policymakers about key initiatives. Uh, for example, we uh, performed a uh, industry-wide survey on the impact of COVID on the quantum industry, and we're able to make some important recommendations and uh, help a, a few companies out that uh, needed some uh, assistance at that time. We also uh, are very engaged in industry standards development through the ITUT, which is led by the United Nations, and also making sure that the United States is not unwarrantedly usurped by other nations who might try to gain competitive advantage by controlling the agenda within the standards arena. We've also developed a proposal called Quest for expanding researcher use of quantum computing through all nine of the current quantum computation companies and, and hardware providers who have capability in the cloud today. And we are uh, helping exponentiate that to a broader uh, group of researchers uh, through the federal government. Next slide, please. So this is our outlook over the next three years. Uh, we'll continue to highlight use cases that are driving quantum information sciences and the industry forward and make sure that we're focused on those industries. We will continue to identify critical enabling technologies and their gaps, and then create roadmaps and make recommendations to close those gaps. Some of those have been in the cryostat areas, lasers, electronic controls, photonic integrated circuits, passive optical components, micro resonators, uh, uh, frequency combs and the like, uh, all of those have been, are, or will be the subject of workshops within uh, the next uh, month or two. 
And uh, I encourage any of the businesses that might be attending here today, and particularly those that have applied for SBIR, STTR, if you're not a member of the QEDC, please do uh, uh, email me or Celia to let us know, uh, and we would be happy to welcome you on board into our consortium. We are going to continue to prioritize challenges and down select roadmaps based on the funding landscape and identify those deficiencies and make recommendations to funding sources, as well as money that would come through the QEDC to be allocated by a sponsor to a performer. Um, we are continuing our standards work. And as I mentioned before, we're going to continue to expand the QEDC internationally. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, we're off to a fast start with more than 150 members, both large and small. It's the majority of the US quantum industry and the supply chain for that industry. We have a number of membership tiers that are defined for US and foreign company and academic engagement. The main takeaway, and I hope that this is something you would remember in a year or two years from now, if you were to think back on this presentation, that the QEDC really is focused on identifying and resolving major enabling technology gaps in order to speed innovation in the quantum industry. We have very active tax across all members. Every member is uh, able to join a TAC. We have established a formal governance structure, formal methods for conducting research and development uh, standards and for international engagement through our steering committee. And in 2021, we'll see the first funding of enabling technology research and development. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention today and for the opportunity to uh, speak. Uh, I want to thank all of the organizers who I know uh, put a lot of time and effort into organizing this and gathering the speakers, uh, and I was honored to be included among them. Thank you very much, and please email me or our Deputy Director Celia Martzbacher at the email addresses listed here. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bros. Do you have time for a quick question? Of course. All right. You had talked about it towards the end of your discussion, but perhaps you could expound a little bit more on how can a company or university join or get involved with QEDC? Sure. It's very easy. You can either go to our website, which is uh, quantumconsortium.org. So it's a dot org because we're a nonprofit organization and we're managed by SRI. Uh, both Celia and I are SRI employees. SRI is a nonprofit independent laboratory. Um, and um, uh, so quantumconsortium.org and there, there are directions for uh, joining. You can send us an email or you can just send me an email uh, that I showed and maybe we can put it here in the chat box and uh, just send an email and um, it's actually quite easy. Uh, starting uh, at the end of this year, we'll be uh, 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 collecting membership fees that are quite modest. I don't think any company will have or individual any problem joining the QEDC and uh, it is uh, uh, quite beneficial to our members. Thank you for the question. Great, thanks for expounding on that. One more question, I, I personally would like to hear this uh, answer to this. What do you see is the next big thing in the quantum industry? Uh, yeah, so I see a number of different things. Of course, there are going to continue to be the technological leaps that are happening. Um, I think you'll see uh, increasing um, uh, opportunities where uh, the demonstration of supremacy, both in sensors, uh, PNT, as well as in computation and comms. I hear and uh, see that there are some real tremendous advantages, uh, or, or I'm sorry, um, uh, demonstrations that are demonstrating quantum advantage. Uh, and I think you'll be hearing a lot about those uh, in the very near future. But the one big thing I see is a change of leadership. 
that's occurring. And I think the QEDC is an example of that. And I, and I see AFRL as an example of that with their um, innovation campus. And that is, it's the merger of three extremely important cultures in the United States that's occurring, where you have the merger of the science culture, the roadmap culture, and the agile culture coming together in a way that is speeding innovation in an unprecedented manner in quantum information science. Um, when this was first noted, it was kind of stunning to realize, but it's also, I think, the element that will continue to maintain U.S. leadership. And I guess in the old days, maybe we called it Yankee ingenuity, but the reality is that we can and will maintain our quantum lead in competitiveness as we con <clears throat> continue to focus on uh, the merger of these three cultures here in the United States. Thanks for the question. What a great uh, ending to your presentation. We greatly appreciate your time today, Dr. Bros. Thank you. Okay, next up, Ms. Denise Lee will join us once again to say a few words and introduce our next set of speakers. Off to you, Denise. Thank you, Mark. It is my pleasure to introduce the New York State Technology Enterprise Company. Nice Tech is a nonprofit technology consulting company and has been advising agencies, organizations, institutions, and businesses since 1996. Through its partnership intermediary agreement with AFRL, NICE Tech has been instrumental in planning and executing this event. I'd like to thank Mr. Evan DeGenero, Ms. Kelsey Zervinets, Ms. Amber Stevens, Mr. Tom Haddad, and the MC of today's event, Mr. Mark Romano. Please give Mark a virtual round of applause and to many other team members who have helped enormously in the logistics. I would also like to introduce the National Security Innovation Network. ENSIGN is an unrivaled problem solving network that adapts to the emerging needs of those who serve the defense of the nation. They are dedicated to the idea of bringing together DOD academia, and entrepreneurs to solve national security problems in new and disruptive ways. ENSIGN also has played a part in supporting the Virtual Quantum Collider event, including Mr. Dan Madden and Mr. Joey Clark. NYSTEC and ENSIGN will provide the overview of New York State quantum collaboration. Evan and Dan, over to you. Thank you for that warm welcome and introduction, Denise. It has been a pleasure working with uh, this dynamic team over the past few months. Uh, on behalf of NYSEC, I want to thank you all for supporting today's event and more importantly for engaging in this growing industry. We are thrilled to be collaborating with the Air Force, state and local government, academia, and the new venture community to accelerate the impact of quantum science on our economy. As an independent nonprofit technology consulting organization, uh, NYSEC's innovation and entrepreneurship practice works directly with these stakeholders to promote, facilitate, and stimulate technology commercialization, small business startup acceleration, and the creation of opportunities in our communities. At NYSEC, our core values drive our decision-making and our actions. Innovation is one of those core values, and we believe that technological innovation is the number one attribute that has a positive impact on our regional economic development. As we strive, as such, we strive to be a catalyst for technological innovation and as a result, economic growth within New York State. With me today is one of our key partners, Dan Madden from the National Security Innovation Network. Dan, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your organization. Yeah, uh, excited to, to be here. So I'm, my name is Dan Mann. I'm the Mid-Atlantic Regional Director for the National Security Innovation Network, NSIN. My, my general background served in the Marine Corps, worked on the Hill for a few years for a member of the Armed Services Committee, had the opportunity to work in a think tank called the RAND Corporation for about a decade, working on everything. special operations to, to major wars, um, principally focusing on, on capability requirements and modernization portfolios. Uh, Ensign has a great mission, building networks of innovators to solve national security challenges. We're, we're drawing community, people from across the, the venture, 
academic and defense communities come up with innovative solutions. Uh, our, our programs in general are, are focused around bringing new people, new ideas, and new partners to the Department of Defense. New people might be through an internship or a fellowship or a rapid hiring action. Uh, new ideas might come through a, a hackathon or we're partnering university students with DOD challenge sponsors. New partners might come through a startup accelerator program or small business innovation research or work topic. Um, Ensign actually has a, a great history in, in New York. It actually emerged out of a summer study conducted over at NYU uh, way back in 2016. So um, I, I think this is uh, having the opportunity to, to talk about defense innovation technology in quantum is, is a good opportunity for us and very appropriate. Dan, that's actually, uh, it's interesting to hear, you know, how uh, Ensign uh, the original concept developed out of NYU. Can you talk to us more about, uh, you know, the history of New York and defense innovation? Yeah, that, that's a wonderful topic. So New York's actually been a part of two, uh, two of the great multi revolutions of the, of the 20th century. So um, the first, of course, was the nuclear revolution that's transformed international relations, uh, the way that wars get fought and the way that we hope wars don't get fought. Uh, the first nuclear fission reaction in the United States was actually conducted in New York City by physics greats Enrico Fermi and John Bunning. Um, the University of Rochester School of Medicine actually played a key role in the development of the radiological health um, uh, in, in medicine required for, for protecting and managing the health of scientists, civilians, and military personnel. Uh, and of course, the Manhattan Project's first headquarters was uh, it was located at 270 Broadway in Manhattan. Um, the, the, so that was one transformation. That was one revolution. Second, second revolution uh, for the military was actually precision strike. That, that really changed. It, it, I think it's in some ways difficult for, for people who aren't immersed in the military to really understand how profound uh, the transformation of uh, precision strike really was. It was so great that uh, when we began to develop these sort of uh, reconnaissance strike capabilities, the ability to, to closely ma match sensors and communication systems and the, and the, and the uh, effects packages uh, with, uh, and getting those effects precisely on target, all of a sudden we could think about trying to defend Western Europe from the Soviets without recourse to nuclear weapons. It's that profound an impact. Um, you know, for, you, for those of you that are sort of history geeks, that gets back to sort of the salt breaker concepts from the 1980s, which are really uh, the roots of, of how we fight today. Anyway, the, uh, Air, the Air Force Research Lab up in Rome, New York, actually developed the ground moving target indicator radars, you know, synthetic aperture radars that were used on the E J Stars uh, aircraft, which is really the aircraft to think back to the uh, Desert Storm. That's how we create um, near transparency on the battlefield for, for major armored um, uh, capabilities. So, you know, of course, it's terrible today to, to be in a position where, where you get ambushed by um, a, a small group of insurgents, uh, but it's a, a much worse sort of scenario to be in a position where you're getting ambushed by an armored division. So this, this was a really important capability. Um, and, and beyond those kinds of military revolution, uh, after all, I think is continuing to play a key role, both on obviously with everything that we've been talking about in quantum today, but also with sort of uh, closely connecting the way Silicon Valley has, has revolutionized um, software development with the way that we do software development within the Department of Defense, the way that we get new implements of capability, moving us from sort of the traditional um, waterfall approach to software development to more of the agile agile development approaches in Silicon Valley. So that they've used they they helped develop the technology for integrating that into the distributed common ground systems. The, that's the Air Force's and the really Department of Defense's chief intelligence platform with tremendous effects, right? So we've gone from it taking say 18 months in order to develop a new capability and get a field as little as 10 days. Um, moving 
there still there a new capability implement from say a hundred million dollar proposition to reach the million dollars. Um, so a bunch of really exciting stuff, but uh, the Department of Defense's footprint in New York is it's obviously much broader than that. Uh, clearly, the New York National Guard played a, a, a critical role in the response to Superstorm Sandy, um, and really there, there's there's a really significant footprint ranging from all the way upstate with uh, 10th Mountain Division up at Fort Drum down to Fort Hamilton down in Brooklyn. Ensign has some great partners across the state, including Columbia University, RIT that, that we partner with to conduct uh, hack for defense classes, um, partnered with NYU Stern's Endless Frontier Lab, which is a tech accelerator to identify um, very early stage companies that have uh, impressive technologies. The startups that we see coming out of the state, coming out of New York with important defense applications, um, yes, on quantum, but but also on unmanned systems, space, communications, AR, VR, distributed ledger tech, um, as well as as well as seeing some really strong uh, growth state ventures. So really exciting stuff. Uh, but but so so Ed, that's that's uh, a lot of background on the defense innovation tech uh, in, in its history in New York. Um, quantum and defense innovation really entail sort of deep tech, hard tech, um, a, a deep science and technology expertise is required to build competitive advantages in the ecosystem. Can you, can you talk about the, the kind of advantages that New York academic institutions sort of create for, for entrepreneurs in this space? Yeah, absolutely, Dan. I mean, some of those examples are, are great uh, examples of, of, you know, what has taken place here. You know, as you mentioned, New York has a substantial and important history when it comes to techno technological advancement and more importantly in having game-changing impact to our nation this isn't by mistake you know, you know the collaboration between academia and industry uh, to solve problems together has put a critical component and continues to provide an advantage in, in the technology commercialization process here um, you know the world set the world-class set of universities within New York combined with embedding industry challenges throughout the learning process is what I think you know makes this uh, approach uh, sustainable. Our, educator our educators and students are creating a culture of learning and discovery as they conduct transformational research in quantum science and engineering with the end customer needs in mind. And I think that's an important piece of this. Uh, these include public universities at the SUNY and CUNY system level and also private universities like Cornell, Columbia, as you mentioned, Clarkson, Syracuse, and many others. Uh, I think this problem first solution second approach, um, you know, th that's what that's what it comes down to, and they're building the next generation of our quantum uh, smart workforce in the process. Uh, this unparalleled capacity for collaboration across the state with government, community, and industry generates a number of components that are critical to our quantum future. In my mind, um, you know, we're talking about things like a pipeline of new ideas and patents opportunities for new partnerships and technological advancement, and maybe the most important, a wealth of human talent. Our universities here in the state are working hard to educate, train, and apply this workforce to solve the most challenging problems that we have in quantum, AI, cyber, and other areas. So, um, you know, I can't say enough about the strong um, set of universities that we have throughout the state and uh, the opportunity that people have to uh, work closely with them. Um, so, you know, we hear a lot about federal investment. Um, obviously, the federal government invests heavily in research, uh, you know, at the academic level. Um, could you talk about how federal funding has impacted New York's competitiveness in this state? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, like we were saying before, this is, this is obviously uh, uh, still very hard tech, right? And that requires a lot of resources, and really public investment to make meaningful progress. And I think that's part of part of, part of why we're all here today. Um, back for, for a moment from the specifics of the quantum R and D in New York, um, defense R and D actually plays a big role in New York in the development of, of IP here. So just, just since the beginning of 2019, uh, more than $5 billion in defense research and development has been conducted in New York. 
uh, across more than 400 enemies uh, in New York. So that, that means there's actually a really robust defense, defense industrial and innovation base here, here in New York. Um, in, in terms of what's been going on with, with quantum funding, a, lot, a lot's actually changing in real time because of um, how central quantum has become to international competition. But so if, if you look over the last few years, since say 2014, um, if you look at National Science Foundation quantum funding, uh, there's been over $120 million executed here in New York, second only to, only to one other state. Um, Cornell, Columbia, uh, University of Rochester, Syracuse have all been, uh, been executing really significant amounts of research for the National Science Foundation. Um, with over a dozen awards uh, each just focused on quantum. Um, and you're seeing this play out. In, in terms of outcomes, right? So New York State's actually leading the country in the number of quantum computing patents, over 140, to only, uh, twice the number from the next highest state. Um, but like I said before, a lot's changing because of how central this has become to the way that states are sort of competing for the future. And so just in, in the last year that um, the, the U.S. administration has committed to to spending over half a billion dollars on quantum technology. At least that's, that's the request of Congress. Uh, $25 million of that is supposed to be set aside for creating quantum internet connecting 17 national labs. Um, so this is, a, this is a really big push that's coming. Um, and I think it's going to be really exciting to see that all takes us. Um, but, but so, and that's all sort of federal level stuff. And, and obviously just sort of pushing money out the door does not create an innovation ecosystem itself. Could, can you talk about the kinds of support that entrepreneurs in New York can find? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, at the beginning, I mentioned uh, in the in my intro that innovation is one of our you know core values at NYSTEC, and the strong position on backing innovation programs uh, is on purpose. Purpose it directly aligns with our partners uh, throughout the state um, and, and the country, like Ensigns. Um, we believe this first collaboration, investment, and statewide advancement here in the communities that, that we live and serve. Our government agencies within New York uh, have a, a very similar stance on this. Uh, Empire State Development's NYSTAR Division, for example, um, their programs and centers emphasize the importance of working with industry as a way to leverage New York State's technology strengths to produce new products and services. You know, this is very similar to how I described our, our academic um, alignment with working with industry. Um, along with NYSTAR's, within NYSTAR's um, system, they have 70 plus funded facilities and tools that are really designed to enable growth. Um, the state also offers different incentive programs for innovation, incentive programs for uh, that foster collaboration uh, with research institution, institutions at the federal, state, and local level, private level. Um, so, you know, on top of that, private and academic innovation programs and investment funds, uh, funds play a significant role in supporting this ecosystem as well, along with advanced manufacturing and prototyping facilities. Um, the slide that's up right now is, is a, actually a very small snapshot of what exists across the state. Um, but basically, no matter where you are, an entrepreneur can access a highly supportive and connected network to move their their transformational idea forward. You could be out in Buffalo with 43 North, uh, you know, in, in Central and the Mohawk Valley. There's numerous programs uh, like Idea New York and Genius New York uh, in the Capital Region. There's the Innovate 518 Innovation Hotspot Program in Ignite U New York. Um, and obviously downstate, there are numerous program, programs. Um, one in particular, uh, the New York City EDC supports uh, many uh, programs that have significant impact locally. And it's more than just job growth for these state and city funded programs. It's about sustainability. Uh, it's about the future. It's about training the workforce. It's not just a one and done to move on. It's, you know, it's to be a part of that transformational movement. Um, so, you know, I guess a, a short answer is the ecosystem has a lot of different tentacles, um, federal funding, you know, plays a, a key piece of it, but the federal government is not alone. Um, you know, at the federal, state, local, and, and private sector level, there are 
there's, there's significant interest in this and um, you know everyone is is jumping in to work together to identify mutual uh, value and goals so that you know that's really exciting to see um, so I mean obviously we talked a lot about different types of funding uh, one area we haven't talk too much about is private investment. You know, how, how is the investment community looking, um, looking at the quantum industry? Yeah, so I, I think it's still early, um, but you're beginning to see sort of the, the big name, um, the big name VCs really begin to play in this space. Um, there've been a, really a, a handful of, of good deals in the last um, half decade. Uh, Rick Getty is, is obviously one, one of the really um, more mature sort of um, growth stage uh, companies out there. Iron Key, uh, Strange Works, Quantum Machines, Quantum Circuits. Um, so, so the VCs that are that have been putting money into these sort of big deals, this include um, firms like Lightspeed Ventures, Battery Ventures, Sequoia, NEA, A16Z. So, I, these are a really sort of big name ventures. So. The fact that they're getting into it, I think, indicates that they see a lot of upside to it. Uh, as a general matter, you're seeing them get more into the, the software, the hardware. I think that in large part for the more hardware intensive kinds of solutions, they're tending to leave that a little bit more towards the, the late stage quantum tech companies, the tech giants that are also playing heavily in all this, um, as well as the, the research institutions mm -hmm. that are, are doing really basic research to solve some hard problems. Uh, but that's that still leaves a lot of play for startups, right? So um, those big, very big players are still, they're partnering with, with early stage companies. They're, they're collaborating together. They're seeing some acquisitions. Um, for those earlier stage companies, uh, for those the investments that are going there, they, they seem, like I said before, they're more going after the software. You're seeing them um, go make these sort of middleware plays where they're trying to facilitate access to shared quantum resources, or they're trying to um, provide services that will take corporate problems and sort of shape them in a way that, that makes them sort of more tractable and uh, for, for quantum computers and, 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 and sort of leverages the really unique properties of quantum computing. Um, New, New York does, uh, has some, some fairly uh, things going on that, that, um, that I think reflect that, right? So CXC actually just had uh, received an investment from Merck um, when you think about the kinds of technology verticals that that quantum computing companies are are trying to service, uh, you tend to think about aerospace, think about pharmaceuticals, uh, you think you, know, you think about the, any any place where quantum can have a big impact on, on through uh, solving really unique problems, finance, energy, um, and, and so Merck, which is a big Pharmaceutical, their CDC made this investment, right? Um, you, you also had New Lab, um, based out of Brooklyn, just made, made an investment in, uh, in, in CDC. Um, so I, th I think there's a lot of interesting and exciting things going on. Um, more, more, more broadly, in terms of the ways that VCs are engaging the defense innovation space, and take a look at Venrock, and take a look at Lux Capital, APC, you there's some of the um, Sort of better known VCs that are out there that, that have taken national security pretty seriously uh, as they develop their own portfolios. And you're beginning to see it not just at the VC level, but also, I think, and, and perhaps this is, a, is reflective of what's happening in the broader economy, some, some of the um, downward pressure on our economy. But um, at the level of angel investors, we're starting to see a lot more interest in, in defense innovation as well. So, from North um, so Again, there's a lot of really exciting things going on. But look, I, I think that we're about to get the hook. Um, working with NiceTech has been great on, on this project, but uh, also looking forward to working with NiceTech on, on other things uh, in, in the future to help uh, develop that, that great defense innovation ecosystem here in New York. Um, I really appreciate AFRL uh, uh, having, having me on today. Uh, so I, I think I, I better hand things off at this point over to, to Mark. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate your time today. Great. Evan and Dan, thank you so much for taking the time today to talk about the resources that New York State has. It's uh, amazing to see all the wonderful universities and companies and organizations that are furthering the quantum discussion. So thank you. 
As we near the end of our event today, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Michael Hadick one more time. Dr. Hadick would like to offer some final sentiments and introduce our last speaker of the day. Dr. Hadick, over to you. Thank you, Mark. So it's been a great day today. We've been receiving a lot of positive comments, a lot of great feedback. I know there's a lot of people out there uh, on the WebEx as well as uh, on the live stream. So uh, we're, you know, please keep the questions coming. Uh, we're gonna, if your questions weren't answered today, we're gonna, we're just talking about it. We're gonna roll them up and try and get them to the speakers to, uh, you know, then go back and answer. Uh, Certainly, uh, you know, the discussion doesn't end here. I know there were some questions that I didn't get to on the Open Innovation Campus. Uh, please feel free to get in contact with Denise. I think Denise Lee, everyone has their info based on the registration. Uh, she'll get info to me if there's questions or partnerships we need to discuss or, or talk further about. Myself and Ms. Karen Roth, who's actually leading the development of the OIC uh, for the Information Director, and, and we'll work that channel and uh, work that collaboration. So with that said, I'd like to uh, now introduce uh, Colonel Timothy J. Lawrence, who is the Director of the Information Directorate, as well as the Commander of Detachment 4 AFRL in Rome, New York. Colonel Lawrence oversees 1,200 staff of 1,200 military, civilian, and on-site contractors uh, executing an annual budget of about $1.8 billion. Uh, when we think of Rome, we mo model ourselves and brand ourselves as Rome equals C4I and cyber. So it's command, control, computers and communications, I is for intelligence, and cyber, of course. Um, Colonel Lawrence has a long and storied career within the Air Force, and he's certainly a true scientist at heart. He's a native of Waterloo, Iowa, which actually shares a lot of similarities with uh, Rome, New York, where he is right now. Colonel Lawrence attained a Bachelor of Science degree from the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1988. He went on to get a master's degree in uh, MS from MIT and a PhD from the University of Surrey in the UK uh, in terms of his education. He's held several amazing leadership and technical positions in the Air Force throughout his career, uh, including at the Air Force Academy, Air Force Institute of Technology, and also in his last position, he was the director of the International Office with the Air Force Office of Scientific Research in the UK. Uh, I mentioned he's a true scientist at heart. Uh, if you look up Falcon Sats, uh, things he did at the Air Force Academy and in early partnerships with SpaceX, pretty amazing. Also, also authored a textbook on uh, nuclear propulsion in 1995. And if that wasn't enough, he swam the English Channel in 2006. And he's a uh, proud father of a one year old, Eden James. Uh, so, with that, I'd like to welcome Colonel Watts. So thank you, Mike. Uh, for those of you out there, yes, this is a Navy uh, mask. Um, as Mike said, I went to the Air Force Academy, and unfortunately, we lost to the Naval Academy in football last year. And my father is ex-Navy, so I get to wear that until either COVID goes away or Air Force, Air Force beats Navy. <laughs> so um, as Mike said, um, this is the conclusion. Um, but uh, as you know, Dr. Roper even started, I'm hoping that this is just the beginning of a wonderful relationship with you folks out there. So I'm just going to give a few brief remarks, and then I'd like to open it up for questions. And as uh, Mike eloquently said, for those of you that sent in a question and the speaker didn't have time for, we are going to keep those and get those to the speakers, and then we'll get back to all of you. If you'd like to talk to someone who's still online, a lot of our speakers are still online. Uh, we can set that up, um, but just now to kind of tee it up, if you have a question for me, I'd be more than happy to answer it um, after I just give a few brief remarks. Um, first of all, I would just again like to thank you all for coming here today. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about the Air Force, uh, learned a little bit more about AFRL, and most importantly, learned a little bit more about our quantum program. Um, we're very happy to be engaged with this, and uh, again, appreciate all your time. The speakers were great. Um, Congressman from DC, I mean, a lot of support from him, uh, not only uh, to the directorate here, but across all of AFRL. Uh, he's a huge advocate of quantum and all the resources uh, that he's able to bring in for us, uh, we're going to use uh, to the best of our ability. Dr. Roper, who, as I said in uh, the introduction of Dr. Roper, this is really his idea um, that we just executed. Hopefully, he's going to be proud with the product. He mentioned Collider number two. 
uh, but uh, you know, Dr. Roper has high standards, uh, but we're hoping just based upon how today went and all of the great proposals that you, that you put together, uh, we are going to do this next year because uh, as everyone said so far, this is a way that uh, we'd like to go. Um, I really like his idea of Q-Day. Um, that would, uh, um, trying to get stuff in the field, trying to get accelerated is again why we've taken time uh, um, to engage with you and get all of your wonderful ideas to hopefully help us get Q-Day moved to the left as Dr. Roper would like us to do. Uh, Professor Presco, um, what a great talk as far as letting us know where we are as far as uh, quantum computing and the NISC era, and also more importantly, showing where we need to go. Um, I always love hearing uh, Professor Presco talk. Uh, it really also em emphasizes why I got a low grade in quantum mechanics when I took it at MIT. Um, Mr. Shahidi talking about linking up relationships and unifying. Uh, I think that's a very important message. Uh, um, getting small businesses engaged with academia, that's really what the STTR program is all about, uh, which we use today. Um, I think in getting academia and industry aligned, working for the Air Force, DOD, and other government agencies is great, and Mr. Shahidi uh, is a key enabler of that. Uh, Mike went into great detail about the Air Force and uh, um, all of our quantum programs showing where we are in the uh, near, mid, and uh, far areas, uh, which is a really, for those of you interested uh, um, in where the Air Force is in the programs, Mike's talk is a great reference. I suggest you uh, look at his charts. Um, Shri and Cheryl um, from OSEA talked about their uh, quantum programs, introducing uh, Dr. Joe Rose, uh, who's the executive director of the consortium. Uh, Joe showing the 150 members. I thought that was a, another big takeaway for you out there. Um, it's a huge resource. Hopefully, uh, for some of you, you may now uh, want to join it. Um, I've been to a couple of the meetings as they, it initially took off. Uh, he's got a wonderful uh, group of people. Um, and again, if we are really going to look at strategic alignment and bettering ourselves across all domains, the QEDC is going to be a key enabler of that. We also use Joe, he is our AFRL Senior Quantum Advisor, um, and he's helping us in our strategic direction for what we're going to do uh, um, in our quantum program across AFRL. Uh, Evan and Dan kicked off about uh, um, what we're doing uh, with the state of New York. One of the big things here, and again, this isn't just to the, um, I mean, a lot of us at Rome, but uh, we are leveraging it with uh, um, all of our AFRL partners is uh, using state of New York resources to, um, again, expand quantum uh, to our nation and give us great capability. Um, I would like to thank folks right now. Um, this again was a huge team effort. Uh, a lot of it was across AFRL um, from the different directorates, uh, from a technical side, from a PA side, uh, from a contracting side, uh, um, evaluating uh, materials, setting up content, executing this in a virtual way. Uh, um, you know, we executed on the exact same day that this was supposed to be in uh, New York City at the Brooklyn Bridge. So with no schedule slip going through all that just shows the amazing team uh, that was enabled to do it. Um, the Air Force Small Business Office was instrumental, uh, NYSTIC and Ensign. Uh, um, we also got some great tips from the YouTube and WebEx consultants um, as we were going uh, through this. So again, wonderful work. So before I turn it over to you, just people are asking, where's the future? Um, I think one key data point for you, the folks out there is if you look at the four areas, we received the most amount of proposals in communication and networking. Uh, second was in process and computing. Third was in timing and fourth was in sensing. So that was just at least uh, um, how it shook out for this year. Uh, which I was a little bit curious about. I was expecting it that it may have been uh, um, resourced in different ways. Um, we do have 35 million that is going out in phase two. Uh, I understand that right now 14 of you have already uh, uh, put your proposals together. So we're looking forward to see how the next day goes uh, um, to close it out. But uh, we're very excited about the uh, um, amount of money out there and then moving on to phase two. Um, all across AFRL, our annual budget is about 25 million in quantum. Uh, I would say right here at Rome, we're focused on networking and uh, computation. 
Uh, the other uh, areas that Mike went into detail are spread out among the other directorates, but that's kind of our big focus here. So what's going to be going on in the near term? Uh, Mike already went into the Quantum Information Summit that we're going to be doing jointly uh, with AFOSR. Very excited about that. Uh, basic research in this area, a uh, million dollars on the table. Uh, we like to give about three grants in each of the four areas. So uh, more to follow on that. There'll be an announcement. So I look forward to having you potentially participate in that. Um, we already talked about open campus. Uh, um, I think the big uh, thing to uh, highlight is that it's going to be focused on quantum, cybersecurity, and artificial intelligence. Uh, Mike and the team has established some very high goals, but that's how we feel we're going to make this uh, executable, set high goals, especially in the short term. Uh, we want to have 100 partnerships in two years, uh, which is going to be a, a huge focus for the team to go out there and do that uh, um, across those domains. Right in the near term, uh, Using uh, the virtual environment we're in now, we're going to do short course with the Air Force Academy in quantum computing uh, and machine learning, which again, education is a key enabler in the open campus. So those are going to be going on in July, uh, which we're very excited about. And then last but not least, uh, as far as Air Force Research Lab, we have the SAB uh, coming up in November. It's going to be focused on quantum assisted p and and I know that uh, Jeff or Dr. Jeff Hebert out of our sensors directorate and uh, Dr. Joe Bros will be uh, really engaged with that uh, uh, with other, many other teammates as well. Um, so I think uh, just to kick it off, um, that's just some summary remarks. Um, I know Mark may have a few things other than that. I'd really like to use the remaining time to send it over to you for possible questions. Great, thank you, Colonel Lawrence. We do have some questions that have come in. Don't know which of the presenters are still here, but I'll go ahead and ask it. And if you, you're comfortable answering it, Colonel Lawrence, by all means, uh, do so. Uh, here's one. With the current situation that our nation is in with coronavirus, do you still plan to continue hiring new personnel, co-ops, or run your summer program? It's a great question. The answer is yes. Uh, we are doing our internship program uh, this summer virtually. Uh, we also, uh, um, and the intern programs is for undergrads, graduate students, and uh, um, PhDs and postdocs. We also, uh, we have a uh, visiting professor program. We're doing that virtually as well. Uh, so those are all engaging. And just, and today is uh, Monday, just last week, we've already just hired four new people. I mean, there's some paperwork we have to do, especially based upon the location and where the individuals are coming from, but we're trying to keep the mission going as best as we can. I would say nothing has stopped, maybe just delayed. That's good to hear. Another question, this looks like this might be for you as well, sir. Other than quantum, what disciplines will AFRL be hiring from in the future? Well, if you look at uh, um, our mission set, um, I would say anything, and this is a weak answer, but anything in science and technology. Um, that's what all our directorates do. Um, as Dr. Roper said, we have a lot of tough challenges in science and technology that the military needs. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, quantum, uh, um, particle physicist, uh, mathematician, uh, um, operations research analyst, um, the whole gamut is out there as well. Oh, but also the business ops. We need better business processes as well. So looking for people that's good in finance and, and contracting uh, um, and, and all of those vital areas too. That's great. You mentioned the Open Innovation Campus. Here's a question regarding that. What types of R&D projects within the Open Innovation Campus will external partners be able to collaborate with? Well, right now, I mentioned the three areas. It's going to be focused on quantum, artificial intelligence, and cybersecurity. From that, we've identified challenge problems. And I would say there's probably about five to 10 for each of those areas. We're still fleshing out the details, but when we're ready, you know, as Mike said, we have a goal to launch this by August. So once we're at that point, those challenge problems will be sent out to the world. And if you have an idea, a process will be enabled so you can get your ideas to it. And then we'll look at, you know, starting the collaboration. We've already kickstarted it. Mike mentioned some of the partners. There's a few others out there as well uh, that we will engage with. So, uh, but again, we have the goal for 100 partners. So 
there's going to be a very good marketing job from our side to get that information out to everyone. Looks like we have uh, one or two more here. Are there other technical areas of interest at AFRL Rome other than quantum? Yes, um, we're divided into four core technical competency areas. So quantum is actually um, part of our extreme computing group. So it's just one part of that portfolio. We're doing, you know, um, Dr. Roper talked about bio-inspired research. We have efforts here in pneumorphic computing. We uh, actually have uh, um, a pneumorphic processor that we partnered with, with IBM that's flying now in MQ9, that's able to actually process imaging data on board, so it can come down and pre tag to the users, which is uh, using machine learning algorithms that we program. So that's a game changer as far as the uh, Intel community. Um, we're doing work in cyber, uh, and that's both on the offensive and defensive side. Uh, um, a lot of uh, um, programs in that area. Uh, we have another uh, uh, project called Product Exploitation, and that's uh, taking lots of data uh, um, and processing it, fusing it to make it more enabled uh, um, to the uh, um, end users, and there's a variety of technologies for that. Uh, we're doing work in counter UAS. We have a program now that we've transitioned to Lifecycle Management Center that's uh, being fielded uh, around the world. And then, uh, um, you know, I would say um, communications is another big area. We have a, a program where we're, uh, it's called ATAC, where we have apps on your phone that can be used for uh, enabling technologies. But uh, if you look at it, we have a briefing out on our open domain uh, website that anyone uh, can look at that goes into greater de details across those portfolios. I, I could go on for an hour talking about each of those sub programs, but I think just looking at it as a, as a whole, uh, um, those are our big areas. Great. Eh? Looks like we have one final question, if you don't mind, sir. Uh, can you describe some relationships with academia or corporations within New York State? Okay, I would say probably the strongest one that we have right now is with SUNY. Um, the, you know, the, the whole SUNY system. Uh, we do a lot of grants uh, with them, um, applied research as well. Uh, we do a lot of work with their faculty. Uh, um, we also, they've been instrumental in helping us with setting up the open innovation campus just because we want to uh, leverage uh, all of their academic uh, um, connections they have across the network. Um, so I would say State University of New York is uh, um, a big one, but we have relationships with Cornell, uh, um, Columbia University, um, just uh, off the top of my head. I mean, I'm, I don't want to go through, I, I would say total um, there's 165 universities right now that we're actively engaged with, but we certainly can produce data on specific relationships with uh, um, universities here in New York. As far as organizations, the big one is like, as you can see now, um, the folks here at uh, NYSTEC. Uh, um, also, uh, IBM being the, uh, um, you know, the AFRL and Air Force. I mean, right now we are the only DOD entity that's on the hub for IBM, and we're using that as a resource for the nation. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Rosen uh, mentioned in his talk, but we're looking at taking that, running AFRL problems, then Air Force problems, then sister service problems, then other government agency problems, then university problems, and then international with uh, our international collaborators. So um, a big one, I would say, is with IBM. Uh, General Electric, um, they're engaged in our open campus. That's another uh, Key stakeholder, Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, um, we had a visit there. They really want to collaborate with us on quantum networking. Um, so that's another big one. So again, just going off the top of my head, that's the ones that resonate. But we have briefings that we can get to anyone that will go into particulars about all the detailed relationships. But it's very significant. Yes, certainly. That's uh, the end of our, our questions. Uh, Colonel, any final thoughts for our attendees? I would just say thank you so much uh, for taking your time. Uh, it's 
I, uh, um, it's, it's always strange when you're in these virtual environments because, and you can't see your audience and you can't see the reaction. I've, I've loved seeing a couple stand up comedians it's like, hmm, did the joke go? Did it not? But anyway, um, being out there, um, I hope, uh, you know, it looks like is uh, the feedback we, we received from folks that they've really enjoyed this event. Uh, um, and it's uh, exciting that the, you took the time to participate with us. And uh, um, I hope we can work with you more. And again, thank you to everyone who put this on. It was an enormous endeavor, but uh, I think we pulled it off. Indeed. Well, folks, that wraps up the presentations for today's Air Force's Virtual Quantum Collider event. For those of you who are viewing through WebEx, please make sure to complete the survey that will appear as you close the event window. Your feedback is extremely valuable and will help us with future virtual webinars. Make sure you continue to visit the USAFQuantumCollider.com website to stay up to date with the latest Air Force quantum innovations. We've heard from some of the world's leading visionaries and experts in quantum information science throughout today's event, and we've learned about cutting edge advancements, new ideas, and exciting things to come. As Stephen Hawking once said, quantum physics tells us that no matter how thorough our observation of the present, the past, like the future, is indefinite and exists only as a spectrum of possibilities. I believe our speakers today and their message have outlined the infinite range of possibilities that exist before us in quantum. It has been my honor and privilege to serve you today as your Master of Ceremonies. And I'd like to thank the members of the Air Force team that have worked so tirelessly, even in the face of uncertainty, to develop today's program and continue to find ways to serve our great nation. May God bless America and the men and women of the United States Air Force. Thank you.